All right, we're live. Greetings, everyone. I'm uh, John Buck. We're part of the uh, Beverly community. Oh, I need to mute this. There we go. Am I, am I on video? Oh, it seems uh, like it's only fo focusing on you, Brett. All right, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah, it's using looking at me as well. All right, uh, yeah, we're we're part of the Beverly community. We're going through and uh, all of John Verveke's lectures on awakening from the meaning crisis. And so, yeah, we're, right now we're going to be doing a kind of two-part uh, discussion on lecture 11 and lecture 12 from him, just because they're both kind of similar and tied connected to each other. Uh, yeah, we can introduce ourselves. Oh yeah, if, if you guys, if anybody would like to participate in these types of meetings or discussions, you can find us at discuss.bevery.me, that's our forums, or join our Discord, which is bevery.me slash Discord. I can hear the stream and I'm not sure why. Is it probably in a Discord? Just like how it was last time. Yeah, but I... Right. Are you... Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm John. I'm uh, at writer John Buck on Twitter. Uh, I'm joined here with Submit and also I, Pleasure I, Out. I, I ha have to figure this out. It's not in... It's not the Discord of last time because I switched out of it, but I, I've got to figure. Yeah, that's out. the thing. Sometimes we like having multiple screens and like tabs. And things. Hold on, I'm gonna. All right, but uh, so yeah, sure. well, you, you talk because I have to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't worry about it. All right, uh, so yeah, we're going through episode eleven and twelve from Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Oh. In our, the description below, we'll have all of our oh, notes. So there's <laughs> a lot of different things that we're going to be going over and probably a lot that we're not going to be able to get into uh, just because there's a lot to it. Uh, but uh, Brett took extensive notes, very, 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 <laughs> especially like it. If you don't have time to watch a whole hour long lecture, you could go through these and get a really good idea of, kind of the main discussion points and topics that he goes over. Great. Um, Sorry, I, I'm I'm back now. Sorry, my I, I, I had another uh, window open. It's my my amateurish uh, approach to uh, live streaming. I'll have to be careful about that in the uh, future. So sorry. Did you, did you want me to give the overview of what happened, or I, I couldn't hear what you were saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be good if you want to go into that. Uh, yeah, just the kind of like main t main points from the lecture and, and what the what the theme of it is. Sure. So, so this episode really, or these two episodes that we're combining together, uh, are really focusing on sort of why should we take these higher states of consciousness or the insights from these higher states of consciousness seriously? And he, he's trying to present sort of a, a you know a plausible reason of why we should uh, you know you know pay attention to at least parts of of these experiences experiences. So these two lectures are focused on giving both a descriptive evaluation explanation and a prescriptive explanation. So, you know, describing sort of what's going on, uh, you know, from a psychological, from a brain function point of view, uh, from an information uh, point of view, and plus the prescriptive approach, which is why should we really, why should we care? You know, right. why should we consider this uh, to be why should we listen to the people who are ha claiming to have these this access to a deeper reality? Um, so he, he especially because he, he points out like how there's kind of a similarity between like when we wake up from a dream. That's like a very or it's it's very different because like when we go through like a higher state of consciousness because that's the the title of these lectures is uh, of these two lectures is higher states of consciousness. So the a higher state of consciousness is like this separate, it's, it's this new experience from our waking world that of mundane and how we normally interact with things. But when people go through these individual experiences, it completely like changes how they perceive the world and also how they change their interaction with the world in a way that at least has been shown to uh, positive, like positive benefits for them in their relationships with people and feel, feeling more meaning in their lives and things like that. So it, it, it's very much a, almost like a, a mirror to how we normally make sense of things. Like where, well, 
we'll have all our generalized experience and have a good understanding of things just because it's common. But this is something completely different because this is something singular and you can't really explain it or articulate it well, but it still is meaningful for you and salient. Um, yeah. Yeah, right, because because the essential problem is that the nor the normal way we 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 determine if something is real is by you know comparing it to the stability to these external uh, external markers you know so we we wake up from a dream while we're in the dream it, it seems everything seems real you you totally buy into it but then you wake up and you realize oh you know now I'm comparing it to the waking world and I see yeah that you know that that wasn't real but the problem with these experiences is people are coming out of these experiences saying no that's what was really real. And, and, and not, and our waking life, our normal waking life is less real. And, 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 and so, I mean, that's not normally how we do these things, <laughs> you know, not normally how we determine what's reality. And, and I think he does, he does a, a decent job, I think, of, of providing this justification. I'm not sure, at least in these two lectures, he completely gets there for my sense, or, or, or I'm not sure if I completely understand you know his sort of you know the punchline, but we'll we'll, we'll, we'll right. come to that. Um, but it, but I think he goes. I think he does a he, he goes a pretty good way down the road uh, towards at least justifying why we should be taking these experiences uh, seriously. So so he goes well, through. I, sorry. Well, I I think like I, I know just to kind of skip ahead, but at the end of lecture two, he goes into what the kind of punchline is, and that. These experiences don't give us any propositional knowledge of a thing, but what they're actually doing is giving us some sort of wisdom, uh, which is kind of like divided from that. Like you, you can have a knowledge uh, of something and all the facts about it, but that's not at all what these are. Uh, these experiences are actually giving to people. Like as you brought up, la or and he's brought up before, people will go into these and receive completely contradictory like insights into reality. I went into this and, and, and then I then I realized God was real. And then, or somebody else goes into it and then I realized God isn't real. And I was perfectly at comfort with that, something like that. And so these experiences themselves aren't enough justification to like take what they're giving us to be accurate in a like truth and knowledge uh, propositional way, but it is still giving us insight into how we're supposed to be acting, like giving us insight into how should I interact and correspond with the world and people and things like that. Right. Well, well, that's what I'm trying to trying to work through. through. I think the way you described it is is, is right as, as he set it out. But you know, he, he also seems to describe wisdom as sort of having a better connection to reality, right? So, so if wisdom is a better connection to reality, but in these altered states, we come out with contradicting perceptions of reality, or at least information, presumed information about reality. Then, then how do we conclude that we're actually getting wisdom? I mean, what I'm trying to keep in mind, maybe keep in mind, good. We're, I think it's good we're starting at the end, and then as we go through the discussion, I mean, this is what I'm, I'm at least trying to work through, and and hopefully we can sort of put dig, dig deeper into this. Is it, it? I'm thinking about that. It seems to be more that it's almost about that you come out with insight into how to have better mental well-being rather than how to have a deeper connection, rather than actually having a deeper connection to reality, that that regardless of the truth of what any knowledge you come from it, there are a great deal of positive benefits to a person's life that comes from this. So, but, but I don't know that it, it, it like it's that it it resolves that sort of that modal confusion what he talks about but we have to understand the modal confusion is a purely psychological stance nothing in re nothing external to us changes when right. we change our our modal conception you know the, you know the football player in the tennis court when he learns you know feels uncomfortable when he doesn't know the rules but then he learns the rules of tennis and suddenly he feels comfortable but the tennis court's the same the rules are even the same it's just his perception. So it's not about truth. It's about 
our relationship to everything else. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, like somebody's model or how they interact with the world, like the model itself has to be like finely tuned for the person that's using it. So if you're like a very agreeable person, you need a model that works for you in a- interacting with the world. Like maybe you don't have the confidence to just take things and, and, and to move forward and, and just let the um, chips fall as they may. If you're like a very agreeable person, that might not be perfect. But just in, in, in explaining like the different personality types that you might have, you'll ha- require a different model for how you interact with the world. And I, I think you made a good point that it's not giving us like truth about the world. It's giving us like better understandings for our relation with our relationship with it. Right. To re- interact with the world in our environment better. So, so maybe I'm just stuck on his, where he says it's, a- a deeper connection to reality. I'm not sure if that's what's going on or if that's what needs to go on because another theme in this is, you know, he's clearly uncomfortable with this. Uh, and he, he raises a, several times in the sec- second lecture or a couple times, we disagree or he does, he says we, but he's uh, presuming his audience, but, but uh, I'm with him. But he, he disagrees with the mythology, he disagrees with the, I think it's called the two world approach. He dif- disagrees that what we're talking about is connection to a spir- an actual spiritual realm. He disagrees, he, I think he's an atheist. So he, he doesn't have that, uh, that perspective, but he, but he sees a lot of value. So it, it, like, like there's a theme where as soon as he starts talking about the how people are perceiving it he starts talking about their sense of meaning like his language and we can as we go through this his language changes and he suddenly shifts from talking about connection to reality to you feel like you have a deeper connection to reality and i think that i i i get the sense he's uncomfortable with it and i'm uncomfortable with it too that that there's something here that's worthwhile and has has demonstrated beneficial effects but but just to, but, but but I think framing it in terms of reality isn't really the way to do it. And I think that's what he's struggling with because I think by the time he gets to the end of the episode, he hasn't like there's there's a long section he has on on trustworthy uh, why we consider something plausible. So so and he goes through all the different conditions, you know, all the different requirements for you know why we think of something is plausible. So it's uh, it's trustworthy. Um, let me just go down to it. Uh... Well, yeah. So there's the normal way that we think about plausibility as like, oh, it's more probable uh, of all the different options out there. This is more plausible. It's more probable. But he's using plausible in a different way, as almost like, yeah, the all the different definitions of plausible. That yeah, he, he talks about, we often use plausible in terms of highly probable, and that's not the sense he's using it. He's using plausible in terms of making good sense. You know, when you say it stands to reason, or, or this should be taken seriously. And, 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 and I think that's, that's fine. fine. You know, like he talks about tr- the three pillars of plausibility is tr- trustworthiness, uh, the elegance of your model. So you have a, a, a model that doesn't just apply to one situation, but can apply to other situations and fluency uh, that it has to be highly fluent, you know, so fluency, like you can speak the language, you know, it, and it, it, able to understand it easily enough. Yeah. Right. And that you, you need to have sort of this balance between, you know, convergence and, and elegance he talks about. And, and, and if so, if you have a lot of convergence without much elegance, you know, that's trivial. It's not powerful. So you have a lot of, you know, everything works together, but it's not, it, does, it only applies in that situation, doesn't apply elsewhere. We say, oh, that's not that important. We don't pay much attention to it. Um, right. But- he has a little graph that I think I'll try and redraw the whiteboard. Uh, let me see. Sure. While you're doing that. Very helpful in thinking about. All right. Do you see this? Uh, I saw it for a second, and then it disappeared. But hold on, I think. Yeah, I I do see it. Okay, so yeah, uh, let's see if I can. So yes, there is convergence, 
And then, um, what was the the middle one? Um, it's the um, fluency. Yes, fluency. And then, oh, sorry. Yeah, trustworthiness, uh, el mo elegance of the model, and fluency. Right. All right, so convergence, uh, uh, it like these are the different modes or or no, the different processes that we use it or in order to reach this thing. So like we have five senses, we have sight, sound, smell, touch, things like that, and that's what gives us a good justification for this thing being real. He brings in a, a lot. Right. Well, the, that the, that that if you only, for example, have sight. Right. You may suspect it's just an illusion, but because, but if especially can, if there's a contradiction between hear it. right. So the more pieces, the more different confirming, uh, you know, uh, information you can get, the more you can trust that this is real and not an illusion. Right. So yeah, ha having many different like vectors coming in and converging or agreeing upon some sort of conclusion conclusion to reality. So like having an apple in front of you, you see it with the red, you can feel it with your hands, you can bite into it and taste it. There's like these three different converging um, perspectives of reality or, or take three converging narratives or it's not even narratives. I think it's like an information stream, like, you know, right, evidence. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, and these and they're just converging into a singular thing or agreeing upon agreeing with each other that this thing is real in some sense. Right. You could say if you're with someone, you could point to it and say, "Hey, do you see that too?" So that would be another example. Uh, you know, if they don't see it, well, you probably have a good idea that no, you know, I'm hallucinating right now. Right. And then there's also uh, the fluency behind it, where in order for something to be plausible, it has to be easy to understand. So like. You try to like I don't know, <laughs> break down Oliver Bakey's work and using all of his terminology to somebody. They're not going to quite really get it. You have to use the type of language that they're able to understand. You have to use the actual like physical language, like in English, or uh, if you're speaking to an American, or Japanese if you're speaking to a Jap uh, someone from Japan. There, these this is also necessary for reaching greater plausibility. And, and it's beyond, yeah, it's beyond just language. Like it, 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 it's, it's when it becomes internalized. So, so when you, you know, I can tell, you can tell me something, you can give me some information and I may be able to understand your words and I may be able to, you know, intellectually understand your meaning. But if I don't sort of get it, uh, then I, I, if I haven't internalized it, then I'm, I think if you say you're, I'm not fluent in it, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's still sort of foreign to me, uh, but but at some point you you get it. So like when you're first learning a language, everything's all strange. And then eventually you do it with, you know, without even thinking about it. Right. So yeah, e even just, uh, yeah. So just having a, it's like the model, the, the model that we're using. And it has to be something that we're comprehensible. You can't have a model that's so large that it, it's actually larger than the map, the, than the thing that you're trying to like, the map itself can't be larger than the territory that it's trying to represent. So this is what's in regards to fluency. It has to be a simple enough model that it can actually be um, understood by the person that you're conferring the model to, or if you're, you yourself are the model uh, person trying to understand the thing. And then- so, Ellen, so my issue with his, with all of this in terms of this, in, uh, uh, of these higher states of consciousness, he says sort of when, when you have deep convergence, elegance, and efficiency, an efficient fluency, you'll have a profound sort of profound wisdom. But my question is, how do we know there's convergence in these altered states? You know, that that's a little, that's a little. My, sorry, but you know, we'll come back to your drawing. But we'll come come back to that uh, after. John, I think you're frozen. Oh, I think, oh, John, you're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, my, I guess my internet connection is unstable. But anyway, yeah, so uh, it, it was saying 
how applicable the model is in many different situations. That's the elegancy of the, the thing. So like if I have the belief that uh, any time that I write down something in my notebook, it becomes true. Uh, and then I apply and I put this into practice and it only works for certain things like um, what I'm going to be doing the next day, uh, but it doesn't happen for like what other people are gonna be doing, then that's a inelegant model that I have. Like my model is what I write in the book becomes true, but it's restricted in how applicable that's actually um, valid. Like it only works for, for my, what I do for myself. So, I mean, it, it, it makes it so it's, yeah. So there's kind of the three criteria for, I guess, knowledge or hypotheses or models or things to put into practice, all, all, all of that. And um, yeah, and, and what, what you wanted to get into whether or not this is actually giving us any information on real, of the reality behind that thing. Right, before we get there, I'm noticing we, we have we have somebody watching, Misplaced Faith, thank you for watching. Oh yeah. And Everybody. Misplaced Faith has a question. It, it, uh, if a model cannot be larger than the entity it represents, how does that apply to the models of molecular structures and the like? Well, the models that are, are created through science are very much simplifications and kind of abstractions. And, and like, you can put it down into a mathematical formula. Uh, I mean, I mean the, the thing that it's referring to is certainly larger than what we're able to put down or even like compute or simulate, things like that. Uh, so that's the thing. It's like a model is always a simplification and only, only specifically referring to certain aspects of it. So like, um, I mean, like you could take the atomic structure of an apple and, then, and get a very good understanding of that. But you, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about, okay, this apple would be, have a certain uh, evolutionary fitness for simian, uh, simian creatures, anything like that, because that's kind of like a different mapping uh, uh, of, or it's a different uh, kind of framework to look at the thing through. But I think what he's getting at with this model elegance is that if, if the insights that you can get from these higher states of consciousness only apply in a very limited way, we mm. would consider that trivial. You know, it, right. you know, it, you know, it, it's we would only take these uh, these experiences seriously if they provide us with, uh, you know, a change that that we can apply across. He says, like we can apply to many domains, that we can apply across the board. So, so he's saying if. I think what he's saying is if we can get insights that make our, for example, make our lives better in many different ways, uh, or, you know, changes our approach to reality, not just, you know, in, in an isolated problem, but sort of across the board, then we should say these higher states of consciousness are something we should be considering plausible and taking seriously. Right. And that, that was part of his uh, prescriptive, like, why should we even care about these higher states of consciousness? And it's because they do provide great greater instances of plausibility, which as you wanted to get into, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gaining a better understanding of the world as it actually is in like a propositional knowledge sense, but we're gaining a better insight into how we should be acting within the world and what are the types of models that we should be using in the world that actually provide us with elegance, power and, and um, like more applicability across multiple domains and, and also uh, the other things that we mentioned. Yeah, it's like, like it seems to me that the convergence aspect has to be just, are we having good effects afterwards in how we're, you know, are the transformation, transformational changes we're making after these, these having these experiences, are they bettering our lives? And, and if, and, if we measure that to be yes, then then we can say, you know, oh, okay, these are good things. And 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 I, but 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 again, these these are very subjective. And again, it's still the opposite of how we tend to, uh, you know, how we tend to evaluate these things. Like like you would have to say, you know, okay, you know, better for who? You know, 
my guess would be better for that person and, and hopefully better for the way they interact with other people. Um, although you could have somebody, you know, what if somebody has one of these experiences, feels better in themselves, but then stay, tries, you know, focuses just on, you know, getting back to that experience and ignores all the other parts of his right. life. You know, you might say, uh, you know, that that wouldn't be a good. Now, I don't know if that's what ever, that's what happens, but, but I, again, I'm still not clear really on, on how we're, we're, we're deciding, you know, he, he goes through, he goes through some really good descriptions on what's going through the brain when we have these, when, you know, they, they've measured brain waves while people are having these experiences and, 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 and you can see all sorts of different uh, pathways that are, that are opening up and then closing down at the same time. And so we can see that there are real changes. So you could say, okay, yes, we can, we can infer there that, you know, he calls them emergent properties that we, we have an emergent ability to, you know, reflect on these things and to synthesize what we're looking at. Uh, and that's, I think he's done a good job of demonstrating that, but that's still not the same as saying, okay, but, but we've done it right. You know, so we've correctly with this expanded capacity, we've reached the correct conclusion. And, and, and that, yeah, that's, that's what I'm sort of, struggling with in, in in where it goes through. we're sort of jumping around but i guess that's okay <laughs> yeah uh, i actually have to go grab the uh, cord for the, the laptop but uh if uh i don't know submit if you want to add anything from i don't know maybe your takeaways from uh, the lectures we'll be listening into okay thank you uh up submit we're ha i'm having trouble hearing you when there's a buzz i don't know if you want to Unplug your, maybe unplug your headphones and plug them back in or, okay, I think that's better. Uh, hey, hi. Yeah, better. Okay. Uh, uh, so it was a lot of jargon for me. Uh, uh, I didn't, I mean, I don't have much to say on this uh, lecture uh, uh, because I couldn't uh, really, uh, connect what I know with any of the models that he was talking about. Sure. Well, well let me, so what, what do you, what he presents? So he, he presents what he calls his continuity, continuity hypothesis. It, it, it's where he says like the same, this is, this is work that, that John Vervecki himself is, is doing in, in his own research. Uh, and this is a hypothesis he himself has proposed. And he says that the same machinery that we use in the, you know, in becoming say fluent at reading, uh, you know, apply to moments of insight, to flow, and then to sort of to having a, a transformative experience. So that 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 each sort of can can lead to the next. So so you could start off with uh, with fluency, you then can lead, get to insight, you can then get to what's called a uh, flow state, and we can come back to this. And then uh, you get this sort of change, this this sort of deep insight that leads to a transformative experience that leads you then, he says, to to uh, to change your life or to want to change your life to be you know to to be more in conformity with 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 this insight. Uh, so, like, but it, all of this is you know it's a skill. This isn't something that that just happens. So flow. Is sort of when you, you get this when you get enough expertise, and and he, he talks about that you can get to an optimal grip on the world. So the metaphorical grip uh, that you know you know we have a good grip. You know w w you know when if we're looking at a cup, you know we don't want to be too far away. We don't want to be too close. If we're too far away, we can't see the detail. If we're too close, we see too much detail. So you're trying to get uh, this this optimal grip. And, you know, same for example uh, with with martial arts. You know, he he talks about so. You know, you, you have a stance that you want to be you know, that that allows you to uh, to go off into many different directions, uh, and and you don't want to be too close to the person, you don't want to be too far from the person, the other person. Uh, you want the right position that allows you to you know attack or or defend. So this that that a lot of this is is what apparently these these altered states of consciousness do is it helps you get 
a, a better optimal grip sort of on the world, I think, as, as he describes it, that, that, you know, you, you turn it from, you know, whatever you're looking at to, to, to everything. And, and, and I guess, you know, it's hard to imagine because it's, it's a subjective experience. Uh, so my way of doing things, you know, sort of you want the scientific way, we, okay, well, I have this perception, then, okay, now I want to test it. Does it, you know, uh, you know, uh, a- am I really getting the, the optimal? Uh, I guess as I'm thinking about it, like when we look at that cup, or like, you know, talks like we just instinctively know if we if we don't have sort of if we're not really socially awkward, we sort of instinctively know how far to stand from someone. You know, we know we know not to stand too close, not to stand too far, but but we don't. But we gauge it by you know the reaction to the person. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a you know it, it's not it, it's not a truth thing. It, you know, it's a relational thing. So. You know, and we sort of feel it. We sort of feel, okay, you know what? Taking everything in, I feel like I'm in the right position. And if I'm a little too close, you know, I'll start feeling a little uncomfortable. Like I'm, I'm too close to this person. Um, so like feeling does come into this, but again, feelings we tend to say are less objective. So, well, like, and, and it's also not just feelings because like you, sure you have your intuition about like, okay, this feels like a right distance, but then there's the other aspect of like, okay, what feels like a right distance to me, they're the the other person is taking a step back every time I move in towards the right. like a right distance. That's an indication for you that an what, external one, yeah, yeah, yeah. That what I feel like is the right distance is not the same as what they're feeling like is the right distance. So there's some sort of compromise there between what I feel is right and what they feel is right, and then yeah, from working from there. Yeah, it, I guess I'm just struggling with this and like like. I worry, and I don't know, there's one more lecture I think he's doing on, on uh, sort of related to this sort of general theme, and then I think he's moving on after that, but I'm hoping he, he brings this home, or, or else, you know, or, or maybe, like, 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 I worry a little bit that what he discusses in this is, and why he frames it in terms of plausibility, rather than, say, high reliability, is that it almost seemed like he's giving, he, he, he knows it's important. He feels it's important. And he's trying to give enough of a sort of scientifically justified explanation to, to say, ah, oh, okay, I'm not anxious about that anymore. I've, I've done enough to say it's worth pursuing. And I can, I can, I, I feel good about, I'm not just wasting my time with, you know. Well, you, I mean, you know. it, it's, I mean, he is a psychologist too. So like he, there's a, a lot of like what he's trying to do is to make justifications for this common widespread thing because like what did he say in the lecture beforehand that 30 percent of people have had these types of higher states of conscious experiences something like that and so and i mean there's the results that are provided as well that okay if our goal is like the human well-being and then like happiness or living a meaningful life. These are things that people seek out after and, and are attempting to achieve. Then these higher states of consciousnesses are, are higher states of consciousness are more are, are valid tools, I guess you could use to achieve that end, if that's like our what we're trying to move society towards. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, like, it, it's not actually giving us any sort of truth or, or knowledge about reality in it, exactly, but it's still, I don't know, it, it's still similar, so similar to how we just interact in our normal day-to-day lives as it is, as it is, like how we, how we come to discover truths in, and, and things in our normal day-to-day lives. If these higher states of consciousness help us to do that same thing in, in, for the rest of for our day to day lives, then it is I don't know similar in a way in giving us truths, right? Like I can see, like like I can like I have my issues with uh, depression and anxiety and that kind of stuff, and I can sort of see how if I could change my mindset in the way he's sort of talking about, it, I could see that I, I could sort of foresee how that would be extremely beneficial. Uh, to me you know so 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 I, I get it. like like just having you know 
good solid mental well-being is, is really useful. You know, I, I, I just wonder if he's trying a little too hard to talk about it in terms of reality, of connected to reality. And, and maybe it's really more in terms of just our sense of self, our sense of our agency and our relationship to the arena. And that's fine. I don't think we necessarily need to say we're actually like, like we're actually seeing patterns that we didn't see before. Like, because we, it, it's hard to tell if we're seeing a real pattern there or, or, you know, just, you know, a real pattern that exists independently, a real feature of the universe. And we'll get into sort of what he talks about in ver figuring out the difference between, you know, what's variant and what's invariant. But, but, but if it, you know, if we're more comfortable in ourselves and our relationship with the world, that's, that's amazing. And that's worth, that's justification enough, even if we can say, you know, maybe we haven't, even if we don't even pretend we've, we've discovered some invariant, that, some pattern that's, re, that's out there independent of our minds. I see what you're saying. Like, it, it might be the case that, like, having a model that is elegant has a, a lot of these converging points and also is very, um, um, what's the term? <laughs> uh, fluent for us. That doesn't necessarily mean that this model is more the most real. Like it may be that there's the real model for reality, or, or like what reality actually is, doesn't take into account any other converging points. Like it, it like it doesn't even require like humans' ability to understand it to for it to be real, and it doesn't. Uh, have any applicability towards humans in their achieving other goals. Uh, so it, it could very well be that this is something that is highly, highly useful for us as humans, but not necessarily a, an accurate picture of reality. In fact, I'm uh, reading Donald Hoffman's latest book, um, uh, uh, something about reality. But but <laughs> he's, he's yeah he, he's making the case that uh, evolution and, and like even in theoretical uh, simulations of evolution will only provide information of fitness for the, the creatures that are evolving and less so information about reality. So it, in between like a competition between a creature that, a creature that's only being informed of fitness enhancing points on, on, the, on, on the playing board or whatever it is versus the creature that is being informed of all of what the board actually is, the creature that is being only shown what's fitness in enhancing is the one that's going to be surviving. So like if like that's the whole uh, argument he makes for like why we've evolved the sense of color that we do, where red apples upon green backgrounds are very are highly useful for simian creatures. But for like dogs, they that red green, a distinction isn't really in a, a, a useful thing for them. And so that's not a, th that concept of color or uh, between red and green for dogs is a, like an unnecessary concept or an unreal concept. Well, imagine if we suddenly, if somebody through some weird fluke uh, suddenly saw the world in terms of particles, like not through a microscope, we just saw everything in terms of these pixelated particles and it was just like this mass of particles that would not be very beneficial to us. We wouldn't be able to differentiate between anything. We wouldn't be, we'd see just, we'd see like everything. if you saw air particles and pollen and things all in front of you, you couldn't be able to. You know, if I, yeah, if I looked at you, who, who's that painter and, you know, Sunday in the Park with George, uh, you know, the guy, all his painting was little oh, yeah, dark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that when you get farther back, you, you see a picture, but if you're really up close, it, it's just little, little dots. And, you know, so that might be more real, we could say. We would be seeing reality closer to the way it really is, but, but it wouldn't, wouldn't help us. And, it, you know, it, it, it would cause right. problems. It's not necessarily, I, I just think his focus on connected to realness, I think, I, I buy that it's a feeling. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think we need to know, I, I don't think we need to say that it's, it really is a deeper connection to reality um, or that wisdom is being closer to reality because it may not be like, like, like. We'd have to have some sort of overlapping though with reality, because if you had like the belief that, oh, I'm the reincarnation of Jesus Christ through some sort of uh, mystical experience. And then you go about trying to apply that into your life uh, 
and you get stunned by your community and people think you're a crazy person and they put you in a loony bin, then this is a element of your model of reality not having high applicability towards uh, actually interacting with, with you. So there has to be some sort of balance there between what we're feeling is real and how that feeling when put into practice responds and either allows that feeling to con uh, allows that feeling of reality to continue or we'll have to uh, put some sort of objection to it. Like uh, that's uh, Peterson brings up that there's a way that you can think about objective reality in sort of two ways where um, there's the reality as a space of objects or you can think of reality as the things that object to our models. <laughs> like if you have a, a, a model of reality where you can walk outside in the rain without getting wet and then, oh no, rain is hitting me. And now that's objecting to my theory about walking outside and not getting wet. Yeah, I, don't know, I should say language bird is watching and your, your shirt makes him want to go to Subway. So that, that uh, oh no, things language language for. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. So, so we go, there's this. I think one of the most interesting uh, themes of these lectures, these two lectures, is he talks about the disruptive strategies, and that these disruptive strategies are essential to gaining insight. So that yeah. uh, that that you know, you need to sort of interrupt your normal sense of thinking or just how you go about things in order to get a better level of insight. He brings in, you know, research into AI and how they, they found that to get AI, you know, processing more optimally, you know, in, in terms of pattern recognition, you know, so they, so the AI was either looking too close at it. So looking at a small sample and, and attributing a, a greater, you know, uh, application to to the whole sample which which was which was wrong because it, it wasn't taking it, it shouldn't generalize or it was generalizing too much and the way they found to fix this and it's crazy is that by it injecting noise into these neural networks these uh these neural networks were better able to properly assess this, the uh the statistical rep uh, relevance by by not over generalizing a sample or or under generalizing a sample, and and that sort of a crazy idea that just by deliberately injecting noise it solved this problem like that's mystifying. Maybe I mean it, maybe they understand it, but like that <laughs> blew my mind when I yeah when I, yeah that was like one of the coolest things that he talked about, and especially like how he uh, related it back to his story of the cup, where like you have a cup in front of you. But if you move around the cup, you're getting a much like wider or a more noisy picture, I, I guess. And you're, mm -hmm. you're not, what you're doing, what you're getting from that is you're finding out what doesn't change. So, right. if, I move, so if I move my head to the left here, what doesn't change is uh, the fact that this kind of stays within my, uh, scope of vision but if i turn my head all the way around what does change is that that cup kind of disappears but it's not really a useful example but just by adding in new things to the picture there's a lot okay yeah by adding in new things the things that doesn't change from that addition of new things gives us a greater idea of like what the the thing itself is so uh i, I don't know yeah we talked about you know very like we, we talk about science, we use variables to figure out what's invariant. So we change, you know, mm -hmm. so we'll change one variable each time to see if something else doesn't same. change. Do we see yeah. what stays the same? And then, then we can figure out that way what, you know, what's more objective. And that's, so that's the whole, the whole point uh, of science is, is to do, to do this. And, and like, you know, but, uh, but he, he talks about these, these you know, these what are, these disruptive strategies are essential to achieving these insights. Mm. But then he adds in this this he adds in this caution that you know, if you just do all this stuff on your own, you these insights can go in a really dangerous way. <laughs> right. It, yeah, that's something he brings up multiple times, like I think three times in maybe the second lecture that 
if you don't have some sort of like wisdom tradition to ground these high, uh, higher states of consciousness within, like somebody that you can, people that you can articulate yourself to and try to get some meaning from that. If you don't have this, then you're just going to kind of be, I don't know, like a recursive loop onto yourself where you're just kind of building up this new idea and, and like really put, putting yourself into some sort of self-delusion just because like, oh, you get this one idea. And that's the thing too, like you're a sample size of one. If you receive some sort of higher state of consciousness and then some sort of um, like enlightened uh, insight from, from that. And then, but it might just be the case that this enlightened insight is only for your own specific, very specific case. And if you were to try to tell other people about this thing, they'll be like, okay, well, I had like an opposite insight. And so that might be, correct for you, but how can we also apply this other thing that I had and see where we can get them to cohere in some way? And that's the thing, like he brings in, like, I think he's primarily referring to like Buddhist temples and, and Hinduistic temples that have put it in this type of practice for these. Higher right, states. because right now we don't have secular institutions that are geared towards wisdom. But it's a little discouraging because, you know, I've sort of on my own, you know, I've taken, I've taken a few mindfulness meditation courses and, you know, I, I've got Sam Harris's app, you know, where he has his lessons and I irregularly go through them, but I'd like to, like, I really like meditation. I, I'd love to have these experiences and, you know, I'm trying to meditate more, uh, but I'm really doing this on my own, maybe listen, taking courses here or there or whatnot, but I, I don't think I'm likely to join a, a Buddhist temple and just integrate myself into that into that community. So it was a little discouraging. Like, I don't know if he's saying, hey, just don't do it on your own. <laughs> you know, if you're not doing this, that instinctively, I re kind of reject that. Like, I, I want to sort of do my own, I want to try to meditate more and hopefully I will have something. But so I don't know if he's really, I don't know what he's sort of suggesting there. Like, we can't all just join, devote our lives to joining, you know, sure. like to getting yeah, but... a guru and teacher and, you know, but at least having people that I don't know have some sort of more like more experience with it. Like if you if you just picked up a uh, textbook on biology uh, and, and then you decided like okay I'm gonna go practice medicine now, like that that wouldn't really work. You'd have to actually interact and like get the learning right. from other doctors and things like that. Uh, and, and I don't know maybe it's something similar to that where like if you put these types of things into practice without a good structural structure, like a good framework to actually understand these types of things and maybe even to guide you through it. Cause like I, I've heard like different stories from people that go through ayahuasca ceremonies and they have uh, like a, a teacher that actually like talks them through it, gets, to, gets them to understand what's going on. Has right. Sort of like grounding for that experience that gives them more greater comfort in, in actually going through with it. Let's do it. Like I've never done psychedelics, but I sort of want to. I just I have no idea how to get them. Uh, <laughs> but 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 it, but it makes the point that you know if I did do that, you know I I shouldn't just do it on my own or even just with a friend who doesn't know what they're doing. I you know I would want to do it with somebody who who knows what they're doing and who, you know who can guide mm -hmm. guide you through it. You know, but yeah, but 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 the thing is there are. Like there's still a lot of things that I think you can take even on the the lesser level. Like he talks about uh, Igor Grossman's work on decentering strategies. Uh, he talks about the Solomon effect that when you give somebody a messy problem that they're stuck in, you know, so they've been trying to work through this issue and they're just going over the same stuff over and over again, they can't move forward. Uh, the way the way they shift them out of it often. Is, so they're talking about it from an egocentric perspective. So I'm, I'm trying to work through this. I'm thinking about it like this. Uh, but the goal is to then get the person to re-describe the problem from the third person pers perspective. And that what this does is breaks your frame. And that sometimes by doing that, you can realize the way you were blocked and then have a central insight on how to resolve the problem. So, so and, and yeah. And, yeah, it is really cool. Like it actually gives you a bit of like oh, take take home advice for these types. Yeah, of like we could use this today. I know exactly. It is so cool because um, 
I noticed this one time in, in, during a Twitter conversation where I was just doing a back and forth with somebody. It seemed like we were disagreeing kind of the whole time. And then just because I was like trying to wrap it up, I was like, okay, let's, I want to actually get a better understanding of like what actually, where are we disagreeing here? So I went back through our past like, like 20 conversation thread or something like that. And then I just wrote down each of the different points that both of us were mm-hmm. making. And it was really interesting to, because like I had to actually uh, reframe what they had said, not in a way where like I'm going to have to be uh, arguing against it, but just making it like making a dialogue tree that that happened where he said what this thing I responded with this and then I and it, it was very much like looking at this conversation that I was partaking in from a third person perspective and trying to articulate it kind of objectively. And then from doing that, it gave me a much better understanding of like where we were actually disagreeing and like being able to see like the the flow of thought between it. And and suddenly you got, okay, I get where we're off now. I get Mm -hmm. why we were butting up against each other. So that would be your insight. Right. So by centralizing it, you have the insight. Like I I talk a lot about, you know, us versus them. And I talk about putting yourself in the other person's shoes in a conversation. So, you know, I try to think, okay, how would... If I was the other person I'm talking to, how would I be reacting to what I'm saying to them? And that can sometimes get past sort of, you know, we, we get stuck in the, oh, they've just said this, you know, they're, they're a jerk, you know, whatever. But if, if, you, if you can sort of say, okay, well, let me put myself in their perspective based on what I just said to them, can I see how maybe they're not just being a jerk, but, but, it, but it affected them in a certain way and, and, and this is where they're coming from. So, and again, I think uh, that's, I guess, I think another decentering strategy. Yeah. And, and that's something he brings up at the very first uh, part of the lecture 11, that the people that go through these higher states of consciousnesses are, they speak from a more allocentric is the term he uses, where right. instead of egocentric. So it's like they, it kind of restructures or reframes how they interact with the world. So uh, allocentric, how he describes it is like instead of describing things in regards to its relation to itself like okay this is left of me this is to my right uh this is something that i'm looking after uh this is something i'm working towards things like that describing it in regards to some greater thing beside yourself so like uh i could describe my position in relation to north south uh mm-hmm. east west, just in regards to the north pole or um maybe even regards to other people. So like I'm doing this thing, not for myself, but for the, for the other person that I, I'm, I'm seeking the good for, something like that. Um, so it's interesting at least that these, they have the, I guess one of the examples of the longstanding or effects from these higher states of consciousness. The other thing he, he brought up that I found quite fascinating was the, uh, the theory that the flow state and gaining fluency for things and, and get, having insight uh, and these higher states of consciousness are all kind of part of the same mechanism that are just right. adapted and built up off of each other to the point that like if you practice like meditation and gaining insight and getting into, into the flow state, then this will make it easier for you to move kind of up the next layer. What, let me see if I can find the exact chain of yeah well he calls it his uh his uh continuity hypothesis Mm -hmm. so so yeah he talked about uh so this is part of his this is his own work uh where he's he's trying to come up with you know again a a scientifically plausible explanation uh so so he talks about you know when where where you talk where you start with fluency so, so that can lead to enhanced insight, which can lead to enhanced flow. Uh, and flow is, you know, when you become, you know, skilled in, 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 in something. And then that enhanced flow can lead to an, an enhanced mystical experience, which can lead to a transformative experience. And so that each, each stage as, can lead to the next. Oh, and I think... John, me. Oh, there yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and the interesting thing, like, the flow is the one that kind of thing that stood out a little bit for me because he described how 
well, well, at least it gives it a better clarification for the other uh, things as well. Because for flow, there's a matchup between your skill level and the, um, like, not complexity level, but the challengingness uh, of a thing. So you have to be a certain amount of, there has to be the, uh, not too divergent between how skilled you are at a thing that you're attempting to do and how easy the, the thing is to do. So like tying your shoes right now is not really a hard thing to do at all. But when you're like four years old, it's very hard to kind of get all these things properly like that. Uh, and also just within your job. So like if you're highly skilled at your job and then you're just doing the same thing over and over again, you're not really getting into that flow state because you're not even higher grade of challenge outside your skill level exactly. And so it, it's interesting to think about how these uh, different like levels of insight and consciousness uh, are raising your um, skill level, but it's not necessarily raising your skill level at a specific thing, but uh, what he relates it to, like his, his theory is that it's raising your skill level at finding the optimal graspability of your models or your interaction with the world. And like, you're actually getting better at getting better, something like that. Right. Well, I mean, that's what I, and I have to think, like he, he didn't really explicitly state it, but, but I think we have to assume that what we're talking about is that the people who have these, these transformative experiences, you know, then find when they apply their wisdom, not their knowledge necessarily, but their wisdom, that, that it just has good effects by however we define good. And, and, it, and it must, it must work on, on multiple levels, like, you know, in terms of how we feel about ourselves or interactions with others um, and, and just how things are, are, are working. Like he, he doesn't get into the pros and cons and what specifically, you know, you, you know, what might specifically get better. Like he talks a lot about, like he summarizes the, you know, sort of the features of what's going on, you know, in terms of, you know, you have a, you know, a higher sense of, you know, you see things as brighter, you know, uh, that uh, you, you have an awareness of the world and you, but you also capture the finite features. So it's this sort of this, this uh, scaling up and scaling down at the same time. So he talks about that when, when people are in these states, they report, you know, being able to see the world in a grain of sand. So you see the, you see, you know, you have a whole awareness of the world, but it also narrows right into the, the grain of sand, but at the same time. Right, you know, like how both, everything fits together as this one large thing. Right. So, he, and he talked about how, how you have an increased sense of making sense of things. Uh, the world seems more alive, pregnant with energy and significance, a notion of oneness, uh, profound sense of peace, profound joy. But what he doesn't really talk about is the practical, the practical implication, you know, what happens then after that? You know, what, what are, what are, you know, so that's great during that experience. But, but now what practical effects are happening when they're not in that experience? Because, you know, he talks about people who have these, they want to transform themselves to get back to that. So it's sort of back to the conformity we talked about with Aristotle. So people, and so people are willing to make changes to how they act in order to get back there. But he didn't actually get into what these changes are. So maybe I'd like to mm. learn a little bit more about that. You know, you know like what is, the, what's the real world like, like he talks about this wisdom and all that, but okay, but what's the real world, you know, personal meaning application. Is one, yeah, like, yeah. like he's talking about pers awakening from the meaning crisis is very personal, right? It's your own personal sense of meaning. Uh, like, like from what I can tell, you can't just get that sense from what he's saying by just understanding it. Like if you just tell me about this, I may have some idea. Like he's describing it. I have some idea, but, but I can't really get it. But so, but then he says also, okay, don't do this without a community, a wisdom community who's dedicated to this, which means by, by practical necessity, the vast majority of people are simply not going to get to that stage. So, you know, you know, in, in normal expertise, we don't need everybody to be an expert for, for society to get the benefits of something. You know, I don't need to understand electrical engineering uh, to have the benefits of electrical engineering. We just need some people in society to be experts in electrical engineering for all of society to sort of get those, those benefits. But, mm. 
But I guess my question is, so when it comes to this, you know, we talked about, for example, you know, just, just now, you know, this change of perspective thing, you know, decentering perspective, that that we can do, just you and I, we can do that and have benefit from it. But that doesn't, even the research he was talking about was just a normal insight, not this altered states of consciousness insight. So that, so that's, so, so I guess my question is, what is the, if we don't, presuming, like the whole point about flow is that you need expertise. You need to work at this in order to get there. And, and, and it seems like it takes a lot of work. Like you need to be meditating every day, meditative practice, both mindfulness and contemplative. You need to be doing, you need to consciously be applying these other disruptive strategies, go through a whole list of you know, different things you can do. And this has to be something you're dedicating your life to, or you're not going to get this unless you maybe take some, you know, a psychedelic, you can sort of shortcut it sometimes. But, but, but the reality is vast majority of people aren't going to do this. So what's the application I, for, for us? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good. A lot of good points there. Like the, the, the meaning crisis is kind of a broad like cultural thing that needs to be, or, or, or is it's a broad cultural thing that, where he's attempting to kind of get at. But if, if his prescriptions for this is like, people need to meditate every day and uh, join some Buddhist cult, or, or not a Buddhist cult, but you know, yeah, yeah. some temple a, in order to gain this greater insight into their own lives, then yeah, it's, it's so, his prescription is kind of such, such it's something that's high, uh, greatly outside of people's fluency or ability to grasp upon that it oh, might oh, it does say to be fair like he does say why should we trust the experiences these people have so he's not framing it in terms of you he is still framing it in terms of what lessons should we take from what they have taught told us oh okay so so i guess going back to your like example of electrical engineering is there a way that where you have certain people that are going right. through gaining this these higher states of consciousness and then can apply that knowledge outwards onto other people that don't have to like put in right. all that. Like, in other words, in his framework, can I resolve my modal anxiety, which I agree I have, I, I can tell where, where, you know, changing my modal, my modal perception would have a great benefit on me, but can I, can I improve my modal anxiety without having had one of those experiences myself? Can I just, based on the knowledge that th that comes out of what these people are are telling us will that alone can i resolve it myself and he doesn't really answer that mm -hmm. so I, I don't know if he's getting into it in the next uh, lecture but or, or do mm -hmm. you think he did do you think he did answer that you... no i i don't think so i mean that's why there's there's still what gonna be uh 38 more uh sure, sure. yeah it may, it, to this lecture series, uh, which is de definitely centered around the awakening from the meaning crisis. So it seems like he's providing this more for the people that are within that kind of sense of existential angst or meaning crisis or modal confusion that they have. But that's pretty well everybody, right? I mean, that's his point. That's, that's most of us. You know, that's why, why he calls it a crisis, right? You know, if it was just a handful of people, it, it, it right. wouldn't have a course. It's a, this is uh, applying to society. So it. Right. And I think there's greater and lesser degrees of it in people. So I, I think he's. So at the beginning of the lecture series, he points out how there's greater distrust in our social structures uh, that are out there. And this is like an indication that there's a. Um, disconnect between people of the society and the processes that are being run for that society. And this is part of the indication of some sort of modal confusion or meaning crisis that's happening. Uh, so yeah, it, it, and in some sense, it, it is applicable to greater society that we're within. But I think it's also like, yeah, I mean, it's probably going to have to be from a personal basis. It's not like we can implement some policy and then no longer have a meaning crisis. I think for the people that are going through some sort of modal confusion, they're going to have to put in some sort of effort or application or practice in order to alleviate that, that confusion. 
Right, so, and, and it's interesting because everything he's talking about is an indirect method. All the methods he's talking about are an indirect method to achieve that that insight that you can't mm. just consciously decide. I mean, psychology would be out of business if if a psychologist could say, "Oh, here's how you should think about your fear of heights," and they mm. said, "Oh, that makes sense. I don't have a fear of heights anymore." Right. You know, <laughs> it would be really easy, but it, but, but the fact is we don't, we have to sort of trick ourselves. We have to go about it. You know, we have to take the long way around, you know, yeah. we, by, 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 so by using these strategies that he talks about, it can trigger one of these insights, but it's a pass, but it, we, we can choose to engage in these strategies, but we can't choose to have the insight or to have the experience. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's sort of a, yeah, and so it's hard hard for, as people because like I've had my own struggles with trying to get into meditation. I've done it like a couple times in the past, and I've never, I've never seen the utility in it. And, and the, and also just I don't know. There's so much other, only so much time I have in the day. So to put aside you know, twenty or so minutes just doing nothing almost seems like what what's wrong with me. But I realize that this is like a fault of my own. It's not just doing nothing. Well, that, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's your relationship to the meditation. Like anybody who does meditation would never describe it as just doing nothing. They would describe it as the opposite of that. But uh, I mean, at least mindfulness meditation is not just making your mind blank. You know. It, yeah, and, and that's what I liked from some of these lectures. Like uh, Verveke describes the act of meditation as almost doing like mental reps between. Yeah on the broader picture and then focusing on the self or and, and back and forth and back and forth kind of like that What's but, really, i just got back into swimming where you know sometimes my strokes just feel really awkward and uh, they're not meshing but every once in a while i just you know say doing the breaststroke and it's just like wow it's just it's flowing it just uh -huh. oh i'm moving faster and it just all syncs up together and and, it, and it's just by doing it over and over and over again then suddenly you're like oh it's happening you know, mm -hmm. I, and, and, and you just realize at one point, hey, this feels really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I guess it, it's just, I don't know, I, I guess it, with the description of the flow state, you have to apply that smaller amount of skill or, or smaller amount of challenge to you so that your skill can increase along with it. So maybe I'm... Ex I'm putting forward too great of a challenge to myself in like meditate for 20 minutes uh, that it's, it's, it's too great for me to even accept a, as a challenge. Like if it was a lesser challenge. Or, like, okay. Yeah. Like, it, like Sam Harris, I have Sam Harris's app, uh, his waking up app uh, where, where he, he goes through first you can take courses, but it's a course. Like I still haven't gotten out of the first 50 sessions, but it starts off with like five minutes sessions you know where you know or five to eight minutes where he guides you through like I, I only do guided meditation so where you have somebody in my ear my headphones telling me what to do um and then i think you you build up over time but from what i understand because i've taken some sort of medically centered mindfulness meditation so it, you know, it describes sort of the science that even a little bit of meditation it, it does make changes to your to your brain like what it is is neuroplasticity like and, and this is what's really interesting in this lecture too you know there's real stuff going on in the brain like like when you meditate when you focus in that way it, it's reinforcing i think certain brain pathways and when you do i think the idea is when you do it enough suddenly your brain pathways start reconfiguring in, 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 in different ways, which is why I think you have to practice because what you're sort of doing is sort of tricking your brain into getting into these states. You know, it's not tricky. Like I can't just willfully say, okay, let me get into an altered state. Like I have to, you, you've got to, you've got to do it over and over again. It's like a path through the, like a path through right. the, the woods where it's just because people have been mm -hmm. walking over it over and over again. And suddenly like you haven't like, used a shovel and dug a path it's just by going over the same path over and over suddenly you know new pathways emerge yeah so and so that's kind of bringing in the uh scott adams systems versus goals ways of thinking of things where like if you put into this practice uh, a certain amount of time every day you're going to be building up a better system that for yourself rather than thinking because i think that's probably my problem is that i i look at meditation and understand, yeah, it's good for me, but I don't see what is like, what can I point to where 
this is I this has been resulted to from this act of meditation every day or something. Like that. And from everything I know about meditation, you will only get those benefits over time. Like doing it once or twice is not going to work, and and even doing it like 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 you it it. But what science, are the what are even the benefits though? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the benefits. Well, first of all, this whole lecture series lot is what he's talking about because you know meditation is is essential. I think to to getting in these altered states of consciousness, and unless you I guess you you cheat through a uh, sort of a psychedelic, but 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 it, it, it they there's a lot of scientific research uh, on how brain states change uh, through meditation and through long term meditation. So they're really. You, you really are changing the way you think. And I think it does. I mean, I, I think it can just in the short term, I think help you with concentration and help you, you know, I guess be, I mean, the whole thing is being more present. Most of the time we, we go through the world, you know, yeah, we're not. A lot of these things are like, sure. You can point to like, okay, these are a change in brain states. We can, these are the objective proofs of meditation. This is some change that has occurred or like being more present. These are almost things that I, I, it's hard for me to connect to, to my own like way of living. Cause like, I never interact with my brain states as it is. Like <laughs> I, I don't ever right. see or, or use the, them, like use them, use that information of my brain states. Uh, and uh, the, and, and being more present, I, I'm not sure. Like, what is that connected to? Like, well, I, I think being more present means, means like a lot of the time we just sort of go through life in sort of a daze on autopilot and when you're more present you're really paying attention to everything like like even if it's a, and I notice it sometimes too and I feel bad like my kids are doing something and you know I'm either on Twitter or just or whatever not really paying attention and then I said no I don't let me pay attention to them let me see them and suddenly they come into focus right uh, so so if you're not being mindful things are not in focus you know you're you're not you know, your mind is wandering. He has some really interesting comments about mind wandering, but, but, but you also need to sort of bring things into focus. A lot of the time, you know, like, like right now you don't see probably until I mention it now, you don't see the outline of your computer screen. And now that I just mentioned it, you probably now see the outline of your computer screen, but you probably didn't see it before. Like it, what you weren't paying attention to it. You still mm -hmm. saw it, but you weren't mindful of it. And, and I think, Part of the practical thing is what I understand. Again, I'm off and on with meditation. Uh, is I think you can develop a better appreciation for things because you start paying. You start being. It's more that you start being able to pay more attention to things because we're not used to it. Right. It is a skill. We're not used to really focusing on things just day to day. Like when you're driving your car, you're not used to. Like sometimes, if I say, "Oh, I want to try to be mindful," I'll pay attention to the other cars. Oh, that's a red car. That's a blue car. Most of the time, we don't really see that unless some orange car or bright yellow car comes out or some sports car, then we sort of notice it. Go ahead, Samit. I, I, it seemed like you wanted to add, add something to this conversation. And, and you definitely have. <laughs> and, and you guys, interrupt me anytime. Too. So interrupt me anytime. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to add on to what uh, POD is saying about meditation. So uh, another reason... Uh, I like it is, and uh, this is not something that uh, might work uh, for you as a beginner, uh, but over time, what might happen is that um, it helps you conserve your energy. And what I mean by that is, let's say something happened at your workplace or some, something happened with your friend uh, where somebody said something you didn't like, right? Or uh, 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 so you may keep, uh, you know, being bothered about that com uh, comment for a couple of hours. And uh, uh, that takes away from your mental energy when you mm -hmm. could be doing useful things. Uh, so partly what uh, meditation mm -hmm. allows you to do is uh, just take in the input that is coming and uh, just kind of uh, flow through it and uh, uh, just uh, have uh, kind of more tolerance for negative emotions. Uh, so uh, mostly, you will notice that it's not so much as the negative uh, uh, emotion that's hurting you. It's just uh, your reaction to the negative emotion, right. like, oh, why I'm feeling this way or crap and all that. Uh, so meditation allows you to just kind of experience it and just kind of not react to it. And uh, 
if you just wait for long enough it will go away on its own and then you can focus your creative energies on uh, on other things so mm. uh, in so much of human uh, even okay if you i won't say human uh, if i uh, observe my own life uh, maybe like uh, 60 70 or maybe 80% of my mental energy is wasted because of these sort of things uh, so Wait, and, and I think, like, from, from my understanding, too, and from what I've tried to do, but not so successfully, but, you know, part of the idea is decent, decentering, like we talked about, where, so normally when you're anxious or something, you're worried about something, it's sort of like, I'm worried, this is my worry, this is my anxiety, my pain, my distress. But when you look at it mindfully, you'll sort of look at it and say, you'll think, the feeling of distress, the feeling of anxiety. You're, you're sort of taking, you're looking at it more from a third person. You're just observing it. And, and the idea in mindfulness is to observe it without judgment. You're not sort of saying that's good pain or bad pain. That's pain. That's discomfort. You know, this is, some, this is something that happened versus, you know, oh my God, this happened and, you know, what's going to happen in the future? Well, and the other part of it is a lot of our anxiety comes from ruminating about the future. But mindfulness is about paying attention to the present. You know, the future will be what it is. But right, but when you look, if you're looking closely at the present, then you're not ruminating about, you're not worrying about the future. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Sumit. That's, yeah, there, there was the the moment in, in the lecture that at least interested me more in these lower levels of continuity when he brought up how for the people that do have uh, like put more time into gaining insights and being in flow states and meditating things like that that it makes it more likely for them to have these sort of higher level uh states of consciousness or, or receiving insights and different things like that that as maybe Maybe I'm like locked within the uh, having mode because I, I, I when I, I know meditation is more about in the being mode, but at least with his description of that continuity kind of chain, it made me more interested in meditation because of its grounded in that having mode. Like if you want to have higher states of consciousness, then you have to kind of put in the effort beforehand for that. Right. Yeah. And then. And then uh met uh okay so don't feel the pressure to meditate because you know everyone keeps talking about it it has become uh, a very well marketed term uh, i wouldn't uh, be so far even though i have done meditation courses uh, i wouldn't go so far as to say meditation is right for you john or you should do it uh, i i won't recommend uh, uh, it like that uh, you uh, you will find uh, uh, like i even with other uh, religious uh, what do you call it uh, followers of some philosophy they that's all they talk about uh, they are like they want everyone to do it and i i have uh, i get bothered by that like um, uh, their whole life revolves around that but uh, from uh, you have to be honest with your own experience so from my own experience i know that maybe for some pe- uh, people meditation is just Uh, the uh, worst thing that they can do uh, because uh, uh, when you uh, really uh, do serious meditation uh, a lot of uh, uh, things come up uh, that uh, probably you are better off uh, not dealing with uh, maybe at that point uh, in time in your life so uh, when i went for the second uh, 10 day retreat uh, it was very painful it was uh, it brought up memories you know that i had forgotten a long time uh, back and uh, uh, certain traumas uh, that uh, uh, like i don't even think about anymore and they came up and uh, uh, it did uh, help me uh, kind of uh, develop a little bit more uh, compassion even though i couldn't change the situation uh, at least i felt uh, uh, rather than feel the anger at Uh, that individual i uh, i felt uh, a kind of sorry and compassionate uh, but i also knew that you, you that's not an outcome that you can guarantee so uh, for mm-hmm. some people it can just uh, so you just have to start slowly and uh, 
as you go along you know make your own judgments about uh, what is happening uh, uh, about uh, when you do it there, there's something that Verveki brought up about like the like what is the function of the self where it's kind of glued Wait, hold on, hold on. before we go together into, before we go yeah, into yeah that, go ahead no no I, I i wanted to relate it to this but okay, it, okay. Go, ahead, go ahead yeah yeah how and so maybe that could be a, a useful way for me to actually like think about these things where okay think about like think about what are the the flaws or where do i wish mm -hmm. i was better like what 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 do I wish I could be doing better? And then, uh, and then also thinking about, okay, what are the application? Oh, what are the benefits of meditation? And then thinking about, okay, could these things that I'm, I wish I was better at be, you, be fixed or, or uh, could, could meditation be useful for these things? Just in order to get it more salient within my own like mental, I, way of thinking of my own mental framework. Yeah, like I would say, so I, I'm gonna come on to that, but first on, on Smith's point, I would say, I, I, I agree with her saying, like, I, I would say, I, I think somebody, if somebody has, uh, you know, those type of issues, they may wanna, you're right, it may, there may, you may wanna be cautious in starting or making sure like, if you have a psychologist that you're seeing, so you can start your meditation practice, but then you can talk about, you have some support for what brings up, because while I didn't have, that I'm not, I mean, I didn't have that type of stuff come up, or at least not new things come up. Every time I've sort of restarted meditation, especially when it starts getting into a longer one, at the beginning, it's really uncomfortable. And often the first few sessions, I have a much heightened sense of anxiety. And I've had times where I've just suddenly felt panicky during it and had to stop. That, I think, goes away. But so I think if you're going to start it, I think you be cautious about be cautious about starting, but also be cautious about saying it's not for me, because I think there is going to be, there, I think there's often some uncomfortableness at the beginning when you're starting. And so you may want to say, okay, I don't like this, but I'm told this is going to pass and it's not going to be like this forever. And I, you know, you may, may want to stick with it a bit to, to get through the, the initial, uh, you know, discomfort. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you uh, that you have to set an expectation that hey, this can be an uncomfortable process uh, so that you don't want people to uh, go unnecessarily not do it just because it's uncomfortable. It's just like the gym. It's uh, uh, Initially, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, but the, the problem, uh, the warning here is that you will not find many meditation teachers uh, who are also trained psychologists or uh, uh, the meditation teacher telling you, okay, so maybe meditation is not right for you. Go home and see a psychologist. So I doubt how many meditation teachers would be willing to make that assessment and say that. Well, well I mean, there is a big, there, there is a big, like I've taken a couple uh, meditation courses in the realm of psychology uh, where like, like John Kabat-Zinn is the guy, I think he's a New Yorker sort of spearheaded uh, this. I think that's the right name. Um, but but there, there's a big medical practice uh, around mindfulness meditation and, and psychology. So now they won't have all the other stuff that that Vervecki's talking about about enlightenment, but there are a lot of there are a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists who will even offer do meditation courses and 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 have it as part of a psychological regime. So, so but they're not going to be the same people as the <laughs> as the religious uh, you know the you know the Buddhist the Buddhist mm -hmm. scholar, you know. Uh, that's not the experience of uh, most people on this uh, 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 planet. Uh, I'm in Canada, so I don't know if it's different here. But it, or, the, I mean, okay. let's say I live in a major city uh, in India. Uh, so most, uh, like, I doubt how many meditation teachers I can find because uh, the meditation retreat I went to, it, uh, it was one of the best. And uh, over there, uh, teachers don't have any sort of psycholo psychological training or anything. So uh, most people, uh, uh, when it comes to in-person, uh, I mean, how many people have access to people like uh, John Kabat-Zinn uh, and well, these, I, mean, there's, uh, I know in, in North America, there's lots of these courses. And I mean, I've taken like two different ones in, in Canada. There, there may be like, if you talk to your doctor, I don't know, maybe in India, there, there's more of the medically, like the sort of psychiatry, psychology related 
ones than, than you know of, but it wouldn't be a 10 day retreat. The 10 day retreat ones are usually associated with like, even here are associated with like Buddhist, Buddhist temples. Right. And, and, you know, but, but so, so it's very different than the 10 day retreat and the courses are, are a scientifically based and, and are geared towards dealing with anxiety and, and whatnot. Uh, but I was going to say, John, like, like, like if you want a motive to do it, mm-hmm. meditation is at the heart of everything he's talking about here. Like, like in terms of the strategies to achieve these states, a regular talked about contemplative meditation and mindfulness, regularly having that, I think he would say is key to, to all of this, to get into that flow state. He would probably say without meditation, you're not going to, you're not going to do it. I think it's linked into everything he's talking about. Yeah. And and I don't know, just like, if there's a way I can think about meditation and like drawing a connection between something I I like to achieve and and then also how meditation could be useful towards that, Uh, like say, just getting outside of my comfort zone or doing things like that. And then, uh, yeah, I, I, that might all, all not, that might all that needs to be done is to have some sort of connection drawn there. So as to make uh, meditation more salient and relevant to, to my goals and things like that in order to actually put it into practice, like to, to get that motivation to put it into practice, really. Uh, you don't have to meditate actually. So, uh, this is the this is the point I wanted to discuss uh, uh, like at some point, but good that mm-hmm. it uh, connects with what we are talking about now. So yeah. he also talked about uh, fasting, or uh, I think he also gave a uh, bunch of other examples about uh, altering the states of consciousness. Disruptive strategies, right? Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, remember that trip you wanted to do on your bicycle, and uh, after a few yeah. kilometers you came back. Uh, I, I think you can even start with that. Uh, that was a uh, that was a great uh, uh, example. So uh, I used to do cycling and uh, I used to go for like uh, 80 kilometers long rides uh, in these uh, hills uh, back and forth. Now that's not exactly meditation, but uh, uh, it kind of uh, kind of a, I see it as a kind of a building a block. So mm-hmm. having these uh, novel experiences. Uh, going out there on your own and uh, going uh, on tracking on your own. Yeah, uh, just doing new things, story. really, yeah. Yeah. And uh, eventually, uh, when I got into meditation, uh, I felt like I'm more ready. So even before going on the retreat, right, uh, for like uh, two months leading up to the retreat, I stopped dating after 6 p.m. Hmm. Uh, because uh, uh, when you go to the retreat for the second time, uh, you... Uh, they don't give you anything to eat after your lunch. Uh, and at 5 a.m. you can drink sugared water. That's all you can drink. So, and now... So, so it's, just, in, it's intermittent fasting. Yeah, you'll just crash. You you will just go crazy, I think, uh, because of the hunger. You will not be able to meditate. So, uh, for the two months leading up to it, I, I will not eat after 6 p.m. Uh, I, I may eat like... Uh, have a lunch, but I'll make sure I don't eat anything after 6 p.m. So when I went there, I was ready. So uh, it's like uh, you can slowly, slowly ease into uh, it uh, by doing these disruptive uh, um, uh, strategies that uh, he mm-hmm. was talking about. So you don't exactly have to start with meditation. And uh, 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 I can't quite describe it when you do these kind of activities, disruptive things. Uh, you learn things which are specific to you as an individual, John. Uh, uh, so if uh, if you are, uh, you'll you'll be surprised that uh, uh, like when I started working out or when I started, you know, cycling and doing these things on my own, uh, my confidence in other unrelated areas also increased. So all of a sudden, I could uh, make my points at the workplace. Uh, I, all of a sudden, I could disagree with. Uh, uh, people and I was like, okay, what what's going on? Uh, so so that's the that's the thing. It uh, leads to growth in uh, other areas, but uh, you you have to go out of your comfort zone. Um, uh, well, that's like the theme from from all of this is that none of this is. If you want to have these benefits, it's not just going to happen. 
like you have to take deliberate conscious steps to that and he called it de-automating right uh, or de-automatizing automizing de-automating so where you're like we're normally in this automation mode and and to get these insights you have to break that up so you have to break so he talks about the nine dot uh problem where you see these nine dots and and you know the, the question is can you line them up in in four connecting lines and if you just look at it as as the nine dots you see a square and your mind just goes to it's a square and the dots have to be within the confines of the square and if you're thinking about it like that you're not going to solve the problem you have to consciously change your focus uh to see it differently so you have to break down the frame and then and then you have an insight that can lead to a new frame right, right. And, and that's yeah that's when he like first brings in the, the discussions of shamans and they had these kind of uh disruptive practices that they would go through where they would they're like take psychedelics or <laughs> do shameful acts that are outside the taboos of the, uh, the 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 tribes members, or they would like take on these masks and personalities, different things like that that they can do to kind of like break up that that frame of thinking about things, so that they can, I guess, in order to add variance, so that you can find the invariant patterns uh, that people are going through. Well, that's what we talked about with like is a really interesting part about mind wandering uh, where that that mind wandering enhances your capacity for insight because it distracts you from how you framed a situation and then you return to it. So it helps, mm -hmm. dis it helps disrupt your framing so you can then break frame and make the new frame. And, and mindfulness is all about catching your mind wandering so people think oh i was meditating for half an hour and my mind wandered a million times that's bad no from what i said no that's not bad the meditation happens when you catch yourself hmm. wandering your mind note it and then get, focus back on your object of focus like your breath like that is the so so the, hmm. the whole practice of meditation is practicing these disruptive strategies where you focus right. on your breath your mind wanders, you catch it, and you come back to the breath. That's interesting. Okay, so yeah, because with meditation, it's like once something is under your awareness, that almost is like it's that's what gives you control over it in a way. So if you find yourself becoming aware of your mind wandering and you continually do so, then yeah, you'll, you'll know, otherwise you would just have your mind wandering and then like, what was I even doing? And just kind of forget it but what if the object is you get better at it you get better at catching yourself right. not paying attention or just letting your mind wander and not focusing and and that's going to have a practical use so, you know when you're studying yeah. you're, you know you're, you're trying to read something and then suddenly you realize you, you i don't know if you had it where you just you realize you've read a paragraph and not taken in any of it because you were actually right. thinking of something else while you were reading yeah yeah i do that all the time it, it's it sucks because like being a writer, like a lot of the time uh, when I'll just be doing something, uh, my mind will wander for something that I'm working on. And then I'll be thinking about that. And then I'll realize like, oh, now I got to go back and, and do this thing again because I, I wasn't thinking about it. But I also, it's not like I want to stop myself from my mind from wandering because I get a lot of like useful notes and insights or what the things that I'm writing that I have to like jot down and put it into note form, which just like completely disrupts my right. yeah. going about and would, things. So. And he links it also to uh, that adding in some no noise while, while somebody's trying to solve a problem can help lead to insight. So I think it's like often why a lot of people like to listen to music while, while they're studying and like I know back in university, I, I listened to music, but I found like if the music had words in it, it, it was too distracting. So yeah. I, I would listen a lot to trance music, which I didn't really like normally. I, didn't listen, I don't listen to trance music just normally, but I, I found it just had the right amount of occupying part of my brain without distracting it too much. So the, optimi the optimization, <laughs> it's not too distracting, but it's a little bit distracting. And that helped me, helped me focus. Like I, right. you know, or, or classical music is another... Uh, yeah. I listen to a synth wave while I'm writing. <laughs> right. But do you find that works better than just pop music with words? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I'll, I'll sometimes listen to just pop music with words, but I find myself like, this is just kind of 
you know, I can only do it for things where I'm not act actively like focusing on uh, the words of things. So what, when do I, like if I have to like organize something, uh, listening to music with lyrics works just fine. But if I'm like writing something down, hearing things, especially like, like if it's music I've heard many times before, so like the lyrics don't make any difference to me. Uh, but if it's like new music or if it's like music that is centered around comedy, where like you yeah where you have to pay attention yeah 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 it, it just doesn't work for it just completely distracts me from uh what i'm actually working on so it brings you like 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 so his whole point is that his whole prop his proposal his suggestion for for why we should do all this is that mm -hmm. what if we could get into a flow state about our ability to optimally grip the world you know right. what if what yeah, if build up our skill at, at being able to find the optimal grip or the things that we're interacting with. But not just the looking internally at our own self, but but looking uh, but, but at, at the world as a whole. Actually, there was an interesting question he had, and I'm not sure I quite um, understand. He said, he says, do you wish to be free from the super salience of your own ego? And, and he's talking about sort of the, we talked about the right. allocentric versus egocentric and that when you're, when you're these altered states make you more, allocentric and and so he says and i'm guessing he's like do you want to just be free from just focusing on yourself but i'm not yeah yeah he kind of raises it as a rhetorical question like wouldn't you like it if you could be free from having to focus on uh, like center all of your reality upon uh, for, through your own brain and something like that and, and it was kind of the same for me it was like well, i don't know if i'd want to do that exactly like i i, I use i use the 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 illusion of the self quite quite to my utility for doing things like uh, but right like, like you wouldn't want to all do, like 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 seeing something in third person seemed like a good disruptive strategy when right. you're blocked but i don't always want to be looking at the world from a third person perspective exactly that, yeah that yeah a, and uh, though i guess to make his point a little bit better it's more so like you're not focusing your entire energy onto yourself you're able to take some of that energy or not energy but like the focus and attention that you're mm. that's normally all like clouded up within yourself and just kind of use it to better to become more aware of your surroundings and the things that you're interacting so but do, you, do you have insight on on yeah. what he's really getting at there like this allocentric versus the egocentric the, the sort of seeing things the third from the third person Uh, that's the first time, uh, like uh, hearing about uh, like the th a third person. Uh, uh, in my experience, uh, th that third perspective uh, is not really outside you. Like it's uh, it's not like you feel like you're floating up into the air and looking at yourself. Or it's not anything like that. It's just uh, it's like a detached kind of perspective. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, that's the first aspect of it. Uh, that you feel a bit detached, so uh, you but he doesn't can frame it in detachment. Like he doesn't frame it in detachment. Like it's almost like you're, it, it's that you're shifting your view from yourself to the world, and you're but you're seeing the world in more, like you're not detached from it. Like you're also feeling one with it because it goes both ways. He says, so so it's not just being. Like you're right, you're not describing it like you're floating out of your like an out of body experience. Although that I think can happen during these these experiences, but but like like there's something he's getting at, and maybe because I haven't felt it, uh, it's why I, I like I think I like have the hint of it, but but I'm not sure I totally sort of grok what he's getting at when he says <laughs> you want to free like like again you don't want to be like trapped in your in your mind and in your anxiety. yeah I think it, it's kind of like what Summit was saying how. Like you have these negative experiences or negative uh, stimulus and you're recognizing it. Okay, yeah, this is a thing that happened to me. I'm just not going to let it affect me really. Like you can get a more, and, and like with the Solomon effect, it's just reframing it without the, without the, like, I guess, causal connection or. Yeah, like like maybe I wonder if it's like real object. Like I wonder if it's like seeing it from that third person perspective, 
when you're meditating, for example, or when you're mindfully looking at your anxiety, acts as a disruptor, which allows you to sort of decouple, allows you to let go a bit of that anxiety. Maybe that's sort of what's going on here of, of why it sort of works if we're talking about the descriptive explanation. Um, I'm not sure if this thing uh, needs to happen. He didn't quite describe how to get there. He was just talking about people have this experience, right? So right. Uh, do people all of a sudden uh, have this, uh, what is this called, allocentric experience, uh, right? That's what he says happens. Yeah, and, 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 and he says that if we want to have increased meaningfulness, we should seek it. Like, like... Right, so it's is it something that kind of just happens or does it happen in steady stages as in uh, you build up to it so because i have heard the from uh, uh, other uh, you know uh, experiences of others uh, who say when you reach that uh, state uh, in meditation you will feel like totally merged with uh, your experience uh, totally merged with the world your ego will dissolve it will go away but i have no idea what to make of that right, right. Because uh, I, he certainly says you, you can practice it. Like, so again, like if you're stuck on a problem, you could, if you describe the problem, and you know, he says it's often in the terms of like interpersonal problems. So, you know, you're, you're having a, a, a fight, like, like what I was saying, like when you, if you're in an argument with someone and then you suddenly look at it from their perspective, I think you're disrupting, you're, you're looking at it allocentrically. You're looking at it from sort of how, you're relating to how the other person sees you and you can consciously say, okay, let me think about this. And I, and I think now I know over time, I now more instinctively think about things from the other person's perspective because I, I've consciously done it a lot. It's more second nature. So I'm, it automatically pops into my mind now, well, how are they thinking about what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where it didn't before, but that was over years of practice, like doing it, you know, building up a habit for it. So I think it's both, Sumit. It's both by practicing it, you become more fluent in it. And once you're more fluent in it, you start doing it second nature. And then it's because that's why flow is one of his stages. If you don't get fluent in it by practicing it, you're not likely to get to that insight, the transformative experience, because they all, I, I get the sense, build on one another. That's why like, I think people do have it just by chance where just something goes off in the brain. But if you're trying to, change yourself to get it i think it's just by following certain steps gets your mind into that state right uh that uh, kind of reminds me uh, okay so it's it's about it's like a uh, any other kind of uh, practice in even in sports okay mm -hmm. so uh, another thing i know is earlier you were complaining about not complaining but you were saying that uh, uh, what what are you supposed to do? No, you're not saying that. Uh, um, I I I'll just paraphrase it in my own words. So, yes, are you supposed to leave your uh, world and go to some cave and meditate? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't make sense. So, well, uh, uh, the thing about meditation uh, uh, is that uh, you can do it anytime. You can you do know that right? So you don't have to go to a, a cave, even though that would be uh, the best. If uh, God can just give you 20 years, you go into a cave, do the meditation, uh, he reinserts you into this timeline. Uh, but that's uh, that's not going to happen. So uh, it's uh, the mindfulness you can do at uh, any time in your uh, life. Like, uh, well, even when not trying, like, like, if I'm at the gas station, as I'm, for some reason, I do this at the gas station when I'm filling up gas. You know, it takes like about a minute to do. So sometimes I'll just like focus on you know, the feeling of the handle or the sound mm. the gas makes as it's going through the hose or, or the cars. Like you can, that's sort of doing a mindfulness exercise just there. That being said, I mean, from what I understand, you do sort of need to do it, right? It's not where you do it, it's how often you do it. You do need to do it sort of regularly to get the benefits. And one thing you can do, like I bought, like it was a meditation store not too far from me where they had like really comfortable mat and a nice meditation cushion. So that can make it more comfortable. So you're not just doing it, you know, in a, your normal chair, your bed, it's sort of your meditation place. All right. Well, uh, I actually have to leave pretty soon. Yeah, I, it, I think we've gone through everything. Yeah. Pretty well. I was surprised with how, how we managed to get through a lot of the main like points that I had uh, written down and wanted to get into.
just one point I want to make. So the 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 goal of these disruptive so these disruptive strategies is that they increase the variation, which allows us to see the 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 invariance. It right. is what he said. So that's why you sort of need so so these disruptive strategies are like introducing the noise in the AI, but mm -hmm. so so we have to to do that to be able to I guess see these in, these invariants. And I just want to highlight on he talked about good invariants and bad invariants. So mm -hmm. good invariants are where we pick up on bigger patterns that are change that that are changing that are real patterns in the world. Uh, so we're more in contact with what's really going on. That it tells us what's more real. Bad invariants are ways in which uh, we're formally, let's say, when you're like working on a problem and you're just doing the same method over and over and over again. Uh, you know that's not changing, but it, it's 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 causing it's causing you problems. And and so, but and, and another bad invariant I think he doesn't really mention it in this context, but he mentions it otherwise. Is I, I think is when you think you see a pattern, when you think you see an invariant, but it's not a real pattern in the world. And it doesn't focus on that one a, a lot in this context, which is again comes back to my whole thing. Like, are we actually? So is, is that the thing then? Like, in order to like disprove a pattern or a model that we've created, is by adding more variance to it to see like okay, it's applicable in this situation. Uh, let's also add this situation and this situation and that situation. And then, oh, it's equally applicable to each of those as well. That's it. At least gives me more credence to believe that this pattern that I've recognized is something more than just uh, just an idea. Maybe. Can you guys speak in a little bit of, uh, I don't know. Uh, like examples? Um, uh, like or, when you say invariance and the... Uh, uh, disruptive strategies help you uh, detect more invariance. Uh, hey, right. I mean, I did look it up in the dictionary, but uh, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, I, I'm variant, really but kind of like variety, adding more variety or a adding yeah. new things to to the situation. Vari a variant is something that changes. An invariant right. is something that doesn't change. So right. what he says is disruptive strategies increase the variation in your processes. So in your thought processes and your mental processes. And when you have an increased variation, you can, he says, you can get more awareness of what is invariant. So of what so, doesn't so, change. So yeah, oh. you, it, by adding all these new types of things and things and are will disrupt the system, uh, you get a better understanding of like, okay, these when I, 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 these things that have stayed here are uh, more real or more reliable and, and less, so they are invariant. Like, um, are these things inside of you, uh, they're psychological or it's about the world? Uh, that, well, that's, uh, that's my whole question that I brought up at the beginning. Like he talks about seeing through the illusion, like he talked about the child who, you know, we talked about the five candies and suddenly they realize that the candies farther apart are not more than the candies that are closer together. If there's five candies close together and five candies close spread apart, uh, <laughs> one yeah, is not more than the other, but, but, and so they pierce the illusion. But the question is, okay, yes, we have, you know, we paint a thing where we have, you know, we know there's increased brain patterns. We know there's all these things that are going on. And we have a sense that we've pierced through the illusion, but how do we know we've actually pierced through that illusion? Like, are we actually piercing through an illusion or are we just finding a useful illusion? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, at least a more useful illusion than the one that fails in a lot of situations. Like the, the candy heuristic that we use, like when you were kids is five rows of, or five candies in a longer row equals more candy. But that's a, it's a, it's a principle that, doesn't really work for us. So we replace it with like, okay, empty space does not equal candy. Yeah, because he, he, he seems to say, if you get in these states, you can, you can fix these systematic errors that we're making. Mm -hmm. That it's not just an error in one thing, we're making these errors across the board in every way we think. Yeah, by adding more variants or different situations, by putting yourself out there in these different types of things, using that same principle and seeing how it, is applicable or inapplicable. And it's sort of this interplay between the conscious and the unconscious. When you're de-automized, 
de-automatizing, you're consciously shifting your 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 experience. Like you're, you're constantly disrupting your process. Not just like like oh something distracts you. Like oh you hear a noise and that disrupts it. Uh, or, or maybe that still helps too. But 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 to really get good at it, you have to say okay now I'm going to shift it up. Right. Like with with the nine dot problem like being able to have the control, like, okay, I've been working at this with the understanding of this is a connect the dots type thing, but I need to break out of that brain and look at it without that I, that way of thinking about it. And so like, if that's something that you can actually like actively pro, like put into practice is like, okay, now I'm going to shift my way of thinking right now. <laughs> That'd be pretty incredible. Are we confusing sense making uh, with uh, the term real? Because uh, e even in our previous conversations, like it comes up again and again, is it real? It, it makes more re real. So uh, I have had some ideas about uh, uh, how uh, to let's say motivate people or how people should be treated. And uh, when those ideas are practiced into the world and a bunch of things happen, then I'm like, oh, they are real. Oh, they work. They are real. So, mm. uh, right. Uh, but, but then they are not real at all. Like they are just something in my head. So it's just that when we are making, when things begin to make sense for us uh, based on the experience we are having in terms of our sense data, then we say, oh, it's real. It's real. It's real. But uh, when things are not making sense to us, we don't have that feeling. So it's it's just a feeling. But uh, when you say real, it gets it gives you this sense that you know we are talking about something like okay, this is real. I mean, yeah. uh, like you call that a real pattern of the world. Yeah. Not, add a word in the dictionary for this. Uh, it's tough. Like 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 what I've come up with, at least as far as we've said, he's taught us so far is that it's real because it makes your life you know that that the it makes your life better it makes you function better and i i i just don't i mean i want to hear what he has to say though but i'm just wondering if this focused on connection to what's real is the wrong focus like it's if it's not really what we're talking about it's what works but yeah i think that's probably a lot of what his lecture series is more about is less about what's real and more about what works and like how to get out of this meaning crisis. Thing. It's like a psychological, he goes into this like a lot in his first few lectures of psychotechnologies. I think this whole lecture series is an attempt at creating a psychotechnology that allows people to uh, awaken from the, mini, from the meaning crisis. Now, as for you, Summit, at least, there's a way in which I have thought about it sometimes that, okay, like what are our thoughts? What are they supposed to be telling us? Like what, what is the purpose of having thoughts and thinking about things? And like, I have a thought about, uh, okay, I, I have an understanding of what's real, but that's a thought. And if my thought is, uh, how is that going, going to this? It's, it's where our, thoughts are like we're never actually going to have real thoughts like i have the understanding of the world a, as it is really and then i have like i've contained the entirety of the world inside my head all of our thoughts are always going to be simplific simplifications of what's real uh and so if our thoughts are a, a, a great enough simplification that allows us to act and to uh act especially within what's real and, and get a, be able to manipulate the world to, towards our ends or even be able to gain greater sense of well-being or be able to understand it in, in a sufficient way, then these are all kind of the greatest possible way that our, our thoughts can be of what's real. I, I, I don't this know. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a big trap uh, because uh, you could be living in a society where most people think your ideas are, you know, you are one of those guys. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but your ideas eventually, uh, okay, so when uh, 
conservatives make this argument that uh, the founding fathers right so uh, they uh, like why did they own slaves so they make the excuse that okay you know that's that's what the world they lived in i mean what what else are they supposed to do but they created the framework the constitution that would uh, eventually lead to their uh, freedom right but that wouldn't happen until uh, how many years like more than 100 years right uh, so uh, but uh, if uh, somebody had made that argument uh, in their meeting then uh, th- that just doesn't uh, gel well with the current uh, reality of that time right and uh, it's only so many years later that Uh, i mean that uh, it's it's just that i mean i'm not sure if you want to tightly couple it with what works uh, be, uh, does that make sense uh, so, because you could have virtue and live in a environment where you just keep getting negative feedback that it doesn't work uh, but uh, but the virtue is very real right uh, uh, am i getting confused myself Uh, no, I, I think I, I'm kind of getting at understanding where you're getting at. Kind of like um, for the in the past when people thought that the world was flat or that the Earth was the center of the universe and their sun went around it, they had an incorrect model of reality. So what they thought was real was not an actually real. But because they had this model for reality, uh, it allowed people to kind of follow in their footsteps and realize, oh, there's these mistakes that or, or there's these incongruencies with what we would expect with this model uh and, and now i'm going to try to refine this model kind of like what you were saying with the constitution where it sure it was created with from the understanding of like allowing slavery but the, based off of that solution new amendments can be made that make it so that slavery is now illegal so there's this building up from the thing that was originally flawed uh be it our model of the solar system or the constitution of the united states something like that that can still be put into place and so it, it kind of brings in the problem of like okay because they were wrong in the past uh you you can't be sure that we're not wrong in right now in the present but you can still at least have But again, his his, his then, meaning seems to be more about resolving the modal confusion, which which can apply right. at any time because it's more about I think feeling comfortable about your place in the world, and and you can be comfortable. Like for example, if you're a sl- if you're if you're an, if you're someone who thinks slavery is wrong, living in a uh, living in a uh, a society where slavery is allowed. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a lot of you know you know there's two ways I mean you could you could look at it as well I'm the odd one out that sucks or you could or you could shift your view saying no I'm morally right and then you're like oh I feel good about that and that would mm-hmm. give you a greater sense of meaning but it, it, you know so it it just it, like it, it seems it's again more about positive psychology and positive right. like a good comfy comfortable about your place in the world. And your place vis-a-vis other people in the world, rather than, and, and and like so, what you're seeing, the pattern you're seeing is the pattern of how you fit, and and even if other people don't see you that way, if it it resolves your anxiety, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be more relaxed, you're gonna feel better. I'm not a uh, I'm not a big fan of resolving uh, people's anxiety. Um, I was reading this. Uh, Uh, beginning introduction of a book uh, i think it was from maslow and uh, uh, the, the point was that if you are surrounded by an environment which is kind of toxic and uh, uh, and then it it doesn't bother you and uh, this is this was, example was not in the book but i'll just give it that let's say you are in nazi germany and all these things are happening around you and uh, if you have assimilated into the culture if if you are part of that society and from time to time you are actually not bothered by it and if you are not having anxiety about it then uh, that's not a that may personally give you the you know 
anxiety free mode of living your life and uh, uh, but does that i mean i mean uh, for but you, you may not for, work to to, to try to fix it you're saying like you you no, mean no just are you okay, saying so fixing, come comes later. Uh, fixing comes a little later but even before that uh, if you are the kind of person living in that society and if you have assimilated as in these things are okay with you then something has already gone wrong in your psychology so that's that's what the point was so if uh, if uh, i live in a society where let's say abuse on women is very common right and if i grew up in that environment so and when i uh, speak to john and john says in his country people are having uh, respect respect for women and i'll be like what so something has already gone with my psychology by that point in time because uh, it no longer bother me that the torture of women no longer bothers me so uh, yes if you are bothered by it you will try to change things but just to get rid of the anxiety uh, you can't modify your own psychology uh, to put yourself in a uh, situation where uh, your anxiety goes away but then that makes you kind of a psychologically flawed individual Uh, because then uh, uh, to give you the example of nazi germany then you would have to have uh, no compassion for the victims uh, so th- that takes away your compassion for them right uh, so you are less I mean, maybe human maybe that's why they maybe that's why the the buddhists include loving kindness as part of the contemplative practice because they realize that the the third party so the allocentric view can has a risk of making you less caring um so they add in the the loving kindness meditation which is designed to make you more more caring there's oh and we've got we've got uh, a new viewer alexandra zapata is, is listening she's hi hi alexander hi alexander and what do you say higher consciousness being conscious at a less dissonant manner better thinking yeah yeah like that that sorry go ahead. i didn't get his comment yeah go ahead submit i didn't get his comment uh, though uh, what pleasure of doubt is saying is that uh, i i i i need to think more on uh, this because uh, uh yes a loving count a kindness angle is nice uh i i just need to uh, meditate more and uh, right. try to uh, think of that situation well just for the audience loving kindness is where you go through a a series of like i i i wish good thoughts towards mm. this person and then i you know you start off by you know picking someone you like uh, or like like a close family member then you you wish good thoughts i wish they were happy and all that to to someone who's just an a, a, an acquaintance and then you may go to someone you don't like and then you may go to the whole city and then the world uh, world as a whole so you sort of r- repeat these positive thoughts and for for the the time of your meditation i see yeah that it sounds good like that way you're not built you're not keeping within you this kind of you're not letting other people kind of colonize your, your mind space and, and like uh making it so that your that like they're a negative presence in your mind so like if, if i'm always thinking about how evil donald trump is or or something like that uh there you go again but but i think <laughs> you is, can't help it <laughs> but i think no, it's 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 idea, back, yeah, it's a common not, example i think the idea is not to become apathetic but to not have unnecessary suffering. So it would be okay if I hate everything that Donald Trump does but because of that I'm just ah oh, I'm in this state of rage all the time. That's probably not a good thing. What you want to be doing is saying okay I'm analyzing Donald Trump doing some bad things there are things I should do about it but I but but I don't want it to make my life miserable. Like, so, right. so yeah and so I think that's why the the loving kindness would be quite useful for people just so that you can Okay, I recognize I disagree with this person and I w- will be actively like working against what they're working towards, but I can still think positively about them so that they're not like constantly on my mind as 
as some sort of like negative burden that I'm having to go through. I can, I can do all these other things without having to have this negative salience of Donald Trump in my head, something like that. Or, and I think it's where you have to come to an understanding. Okay. I don't like him. He's bad. Uh, there are things I'd like to do about it, but I, but I'm not going to let that cause me uh, distress. Like you don't want to have, like, I, I understand what Smith's saying. Like you don't, there are times where you should have anxiety where anxiety is good. You know, anxiety, you know, if there's a task you have to do, sometimes anxiety can be good to help you do it, you know, but, but, but then anxiety gets into, you know, uh, where it can freeze you or, or it can right. cause, you know, unnecessary stuff. So that's part, I think part of it is when I'm talking about resolving the anxiety, I think I'm talking about resolving the, the negative anxiety where it's just, where, where it's just your, where you're fretting, or like you said, you're ruminating, like most of the harm from these, you know, even past traumas, you thinking about it and, and, and refeeling it. Whereas ideally we'd like to be able to say, yes, that's something that happened to me, but that it's not causing me suffering today. Like right. that yeah, would it's, be a, it's no longer, it's like just, yeah, it, it, by taking in that information as you, as useful without having to have it constantly bombarding you, or, or even if it, it's something that's just a residual, yeah, a, res a, res a residual thing from our past that we've, uh, it's no longer really relevant to ourselves. That So it doesn't need to have that same salience to it, assigned to it. And again, when we're thinking about the past, when we're ruminating on the past or fearing the future, we're not being present. Mm. You know, so that, that's sort of where the mindfulness comes in. But there's again, this, we're all talking about a other thing I wanted to go into regarding like what's real or not. Because there's something uh, Verveke brought up at uh, what, 47 minutes into lecture 12 that science doesn't, like we don't believe in science because it doesn't give us certainty and facts okay. about it. what we believe in it because it gives us this self-correcting mechanism and this mm -hmm. uh, system or or plausibility like this gives us the greatest uh gr greatest model basically to work off of and I, I i find it interesting because that's like similar to what he's pointing to with the whole art of meditation is uh meditation and gaining insight things like that is finding the most plausible model and also creating a system that will be self-correcting where like we don't want to adopt some sort of way of going about knowledge we don't want to adopt a, an epistemology that only just gives us this this specific thing every single time even when we add no like this is almost like an indication that this epistemology is kind of flawed in some way because it it's it's not update it's not updatable you know like yeah it, you don't want some dogmatic in your, in your right view. it doesn't take into account that it might not have been structured with perfect knowledge so because science is like this, like finding the things that are able to be updated uh, and with new information which is kind of like necessary for us. I think. All right. So, so what do you like? I, I think maybe I'm getting it more is when he talks about, you know, what's happening in a higher state of conscious is people are flowing to get an optimal grip on the world and themselves. So it's not about much about it's not as much about uh, about do you know the truth? but that you're better able to assess things. Like, like we talked about the cup. If you look at a cup too closely, you're, you're, you're gonna see too much detail and you're not gonna be able to really see, it's just gonna be you know, the red cup. You're just gonna see red and nothing else. If right. you look at it too far away, you're not gonna get enough detail. You, 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 when you look at a cup, you wanna sort of hold it at a comfortable distance from you, the optimal distance. So I think what he's saying is what these altered states lead you to do is to have a better optimal grip on your observation of of the world and every, of, right. on yourself in the world where where you're at a better distance metaphorical distance mm -hmm. between yourself and the world which mm -hmm. puts you in a better position to figure stuff out so it's not about mm -hmm. wisdom. okay so that's interesting about, so like it could be some people are looking at the cup directly face on and it's not that they're incorrect it's just that they've like they've taken on the wrong frame because like having this thing taking up having this focus be the entirety of your focus is leaving stuff out of the picture like you're clouding right it. like the uh Rene yeah. Magritte yeah. photo uh painting of the man with the apple in front of his face it's completely obscuring everything else from 
Yeah, this is good. He's understanding. Uh, so <laughs> this is good. I think good something just clicked from, now. <laughs> Go on, Simit. This is a good point from Alexander, uh, Alexander, uh, Alexander Japatas in the chat. So Right. Yeah. Uh, so he puts in practice versus practical reality. Let us look at religion. It allows us to function in a better manner, albeit it requires irrational thought. Are we condoning idiocy? So kind of like a couple points there, but like bringing in like religion allows for like the cooperation between people just because they have kind of this shared understanding or background or um, uh, like language to art articulate themselves through and, and be able to interact with each other in a positive way. But it, it's still based upon kind of these very old ancient ways of thinking about things. So do we disregard all the utility behind these things or do we... Um, uh, well, there is utility in uh, smoking weed every day. Yeah. You said that uh, if you I guess if you want to make all your pain and suffering goes away, you can smoke weed every day. Uh, but uh, I, I think the problem stems from the uh, fact that uh, people fail to develop the, the faculties for uh, continual, uh, the same thing you're saying, uh, uh, John, disagreement and building up on things. So, right. uh, how, so you want to make your anxiety go away, but uh, there is something to be said about uh, like uh, Piyodi was saying earlier that when you are doing meditation, it is supposed to be hard. It is supposed to, you are supposed to be suffering a uh, little bit. Uh, the, the same, I guess, goes for insights. So if you preempt your insight, like if you are having more kinds of anxieties, right? So if you are a communist uh, who supported the, uh, you know, Russian, uh, mm -hmm. the whatever it was, and uh, then they put you in jail. So... <laughs> you must be suffering. So if somebody smuggles weed and you're like, oh, I'm fuck it, I'm just going to smoke weed. <laughs> and that, that suffering is not going to lead to insight. So you don't want to... Uh, but, that is fine because you're, but you're not, you don't have an optimal view if you're just, if you're just sort of smoking weed and not thinking about anything. Yeah, you don't really have an optimal grip. You, you, you're you're looking at you're not even looking at things at all. You're not you're not you're completely automated when when you're in that know, state. If, uh, if making anxiety go, if we focus too much uh, on making the anxiety go away, then uh, right that right. cannot be the point. That people will come up with these solutions to make anxiety go away. Uh, just making your anxiety go away is not the just the point. So. <clears throat> Right, you can make your anxiety go away by avoiding a problem too. So you have a temporary decrease in anxiety, but then it comes back with a vengeance because you haven't solved the problem. Uh, the same for the religion, but uh, you know, people uh, continue to believe it, even though uh, today for cooperation, we don't need religion. Uh, you and I are, uh, but I mean, what I'm saying is these bad ideas uh, do have a, uh, a lot of what do we call uh, their expiry date tends to be uh, indefinite. What's it you can so, uh, Oh, sorry. Go on. Do we want? I, I mean, do we want some sort of uh, meditation cult uh, where? Uh, 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 I don't know. I mean, it it has to make uh, uh, sense, you know, at at uh, some uh, point uh, in time. Uh, uh, tomorrow, somebody could just say. Uh, we have figured, uh, uh, we have, we finally figured this out. So you take this uh, uh, drug and you'll have the insight and all your anxiety will go away. Uh, uh, and Verveki seems to uh, talk about that a lot. Like uh, that, I, I mean, uh, I, I see when you're part of something, right? You have to criticize it. Uh, well, the wait, wait, because, but, but, but there's certain anxiety that's caused because you have modal confusion, because you, you, you haven't really resolved your view of yourself in the world, or, you know, so it, it's not just anxiety writ large. Again, I mean, you know, if there's a snake in the grass, anxiety is very good because it helps me stay alive and avoid that snake, right? It increases your heartbeat, you know, you know, the, the, you know, it, the blood goes to your extremities, your fight or flight, like you're ready to run, you know, that that's good. Um, but, but it also kicks in when we're just worried about, Oh, 
oh, did I say something stupid? Oh God, that guy hates me. Or, oh my God, I make those mistakes. And oh, oh, this or that, you know? So there, there are times where we're resolving that, you know, is good. But I just want to come back to Alexander's point about religion. Like Verveke mentions this a lot in, in previous lectures that, you know, all the main religions at, at its core, there have been some of these uh, altered states of consciousness that are sort of central to them in, in all the religious faith. And I, and I think one of the main benefits, I'm not a believer, but, but one of the main benefits of religion, I think, has been that it has provided a structure to re re resolve people's, you know, modal, modal anxiety, you know, and, or their, what is it, modal confusion, right. because it, 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 it's sort of a, it, it's a system that provides a way for people to feel comfortable of their place in the world. And it per, sort of provides it for them. And I think that's why religions have been, you know, you know, have, have been so pervasive, Re whether, you know, we're different religions with, with pretty different philosophies or mythology have similar effects on people in terms of, you know, helping societies develop and that. And I, I think what Rebecca is trying to do is sort of, again, you know, provide a way where we can get those same benefits without the mythological baggage. Uh, you know, taking sort of the good, taking what religion has done really well. Um, I mean, you can get, I know, you know, whether there is a God or not, that's a different question, but I mean, he's providing an option, uh, a way forward for us to get the benefits that religion really has done a good job of making people sort of feel like they fit. And, and, and that helps them feel good about themselves that, that does give them meaning you know but there may be there are sort of other ways yes. to do it uh, this, this is uh, i think uh, uh, we will need to watch rest of his lectures uh, because i don't want to uh, uh, i guess i'm here so i can just uh, start commenting on things so uh, i guess that won't happen but <laughs> my fear is that uh, you know uh, uh, people tend to pick up what is useful for them uh, from a given system of uh, uh, thought uh, or uh, practice or what, whatever. So same goes for Buddhism. So you guys are focused uh, too much on, I think, uh, resolving your modal confusion and uh, removing the that you're maybe uh, uh, being more uh, productive. But uh, these tools that we are using, uh, they don't necessarily make you a better a better person. Uh, so they, uh, they, uh, the way you resolve your moral confusion would be different than the way I do. Your insight would be different from my insight. Right. And you cannot guarantee that uh, that insight might lead to a, moral conf a, sol uh, a solution for the moral confusion of yourself. But uh, is that really good uh, for uh, the society or humanity as a whole? whole? It might not be. Uh, because uh, meditation can uh, uh, lead to rem uh, removal of inhibition, just like uh, because Sam Harris had this recent uh, uh, lesson in his app where he talked about it. There was this meditation teacher who would uh, uh, who had ordered his followers to strip naked uh, some meditators uh, as a. I, I mean, let's not even. I mean, that that was just crazy uh, shit and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so meditation can do that kind of stuff uh, to you as well. Uh, that is why uh, when you talk about right, uh, like loving kindness, so uh, now I remember uh, because when I did the meditation course, uh, they they started with the whole like Buddhist uh, system of things. Uh, meditation was just one part of it. Uh, another another part was a moral code of conduct. You know, you have to follow, uh, and there were rules on that and. You had to continually strive to meet the moral uh, requirement uh, of uh, what was that? Set. Like the eightfold? Are you talking about the eightfold path? Is that the eightfold path you're yes. talking about? Uh, yes. Uh, now I I forgot all the different divisions. So I think it had three divisions, and uh, uh, in every one there were uh, requirements. So what people have tended to do is that uh, uh, you know just pick up the meditation part because. Uh, of whatever uh, utility it provides to the modern mind. Uh, but, you know, uh, the morality part is there. I, I hope he talks about uh, that uh, at some point in time because... Uh, but wait, so somebody, somebody, so can I just ask, are you questioning whether 
like it seems to me almost you're challenging Vervecki on this meaning crisis altogether because it seems to me unless and I missed the first few lectures I've got to go back and I started in at seven I think uh, I've got to go back and listen to them but I'm getting the sense that the meaning crisis is really about resolving this modal confusion is that right like that that's at the center of what he's talking about pretty much yeah and it's not just like the psychological aspect of it. like if, if it was so simple as like just giving you a a new psychotechnology that could resolve it but also like I don't know, I think it's definitely, like the reason we have this modal confusion is because there is some sort of separation or uh, incongruity between the way we're thinking about things and the world that we're interacting with, that with the agent arena relationship. So, I mean, there's a way in which you can resolve the modal confusion by changing the entire uh, field or the landscape, or you can do it by entirely changing the uh, agent within that lens, like right, right. in your your mind of how you're thinking about these things. So, so wait, uh, are you challenging that basic hypothesis, like the, his whole premise here, like that, that you think it's uh, not quite as messed up as or necessary as, you, as he's saying? Oh, no. Uh, oh, wait a, wait, wait a minute. Uh, two things. First of all, uh, there's a controversy tends, at the end here. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Well, tends to uh, uh, use a lot of academic terms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't uh, 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 always uh, follow him to the extent that I should. And I'm not saying he shouldn't use those terms, uh, you know, just because I haven't educated myself to that level doesn't mean he has to uh, cater to me. Uh, but uh, it's just the point a, it's, it's a commenting on like there's a limitation to uh, how his lectures could be applied to everyone. It's not like just anybody from that might be having this modal confusion or, or, some sort of meaning crisis will be able to just pop on his lectures and then be able to get something out of it right. and be able to fix their their modal confusion. Uh, what if right. you, like like the can insight... I finish, oh, since sorry, you question, can I finish answering that before you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Start? Yeah, uh, the second uh, second point was that uh, uh, I uh, I'm not sure what it means. I'm questioning uh, 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 Verbeki. I'm uh, I mean I don't want to get into that he he's a much more learned man that um, me I, I don't want to stand up and say I what, what you're saying is you're questioning him but you don't want to admit you're questioning him uh, not question uh, not question <laughs> there, there is a difference between having a concern and my I know, concern I know. <laughs> is uh, so far I haven't seen him uh, talk about morality uh, uh, if you are going to talk about both this tradition and all this async close you have to talk about morality because uh, you uh, so, so far, the tools he's talking about and the way you resolve your moral confusion and uh, the way you get meaning and all that, uh, it is not uh, clear to me that uh, if you apply these to 1,000 people and all of them may have different insights and the solutions they come up with, not all of them, some of them might even be detrimental to other people. Uh, so there is an aspect of morality that I'm saying hope ad is addressed at some point because uh, I mean uh, you can resolve your moral confusion in ways that works out well for you but not for other people. But but something clicked for me here I think in the, just in this conversation and if I'm correctly now getting it what he's saying is because these transformative experiences will improve your way of optimally grasping the world. So he talked about it be, being able to at the same time, zoom all the way out and zoom all the way in, in an optimal way that that would be, in, what you just said would be, would presumably be included in that, that, that as part of our zooming out, we would see that this may be hurting other people, you know, uh, there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. That, that's my that's right. my problem with that. But uh, that's the thing. I, I I don't think it's about guarantee. I think what he's saying is that if you practice this stuff, if you can reach these insights, you will get better skilled at taking it all in, and so have a better chance at having a good positive result. I think that's the idea. And that's what way it's the model that can apply more widely. It's not about what's the right answer in any one given 
problem or any one given model, even anxiety. It's, it puts us in a better position to the cup, but the cup is the world. The cup is everything that it lets us better take in the big picture and it lets us better take in the features. It lets us analyze them. It lets us be at a better distance from the features and the big picture so that we analyze it better and reach so we reach bigger better insights because we're taking in the right a be, we're better able to take in this information and reach good conclusions that i right. think that right there is no disagreement in all of that right there is no disagreement at all uh, i i think that that's a useful tool to have uh, but uh, what i'm saying is just like uh, any tool there is no inbuilt uh, protection or morality in it i i might zoom out and have the insight that you know these uh, humans they really are a bunch of cockroaches uh, plaguing this planet you know the agent smith in matrix movie right when he was making those dialogues i was clapping i was like this guy figured it out <laughs> and I, I i could just say that if i zoom out right if i look at the whole solar system you humans you know you you guys are bunch of cockroaches so uh, i i can uh, because of my great insight i'll come up with a technology to disable all humans i know it will lead to suffering in short term but in longer term you know i think planet is better off so but uh, he may be saying somebody who goes through yeah that's a, okay someone so, who goes through these processes will likely not come up with something like you just said right 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 i, I agree i agree that he might not but Uh, the process itself inherently doesn't guarantee that right. i'm not yeah. saying that it should but what i'm saying is when you are teaching people these tools uh, you should also kind of give them a moral uh, kind of a understanding of things yeah but, but uh, along, but, but, along with this oh yeah oh no i get your point you're saying if yeah. all you do is focus on the zooming and zooming out but you don't also have a moral uh, a, right. a moral framework in which to place it um and it's also a bit circular too because if you're in these insights you may have better analysis of moral your moral system right right too. so it's loving a, kindness it's, like you said will help with this loving kindness uh, meditation will definitely help with this but i'm saying that's not enough uh, this component is also there so i'm not really contradicting anything you are saying what i'm saying is i, I hope this was also addressed Right. But, but like, what, what the, oh, sorry, John, I keep on interrupting. You keep on no, I, <laughs> I have to leave. Oh, I, okay. I'm going to end the meeting. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That has been really good. And thank you so much for, for the people watching and commenting. That's awesome. That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and I know, sorry, Ty, I just saw Tyler joined in our meeting. He did, hasn't even said anything yet. But. Oh, hey, Tyler, okay. I hope you trained the colonial uh, soldiers well. This is good. This is mindfulness. How long has that icon been there? And I didn't notice it until you mentioned it. And I've probably been staring at it for how long? And I had no <laughs> idea he joined until you mentioned it. So it you wasn't just joined like within the last minute. So don't worry too much. All right. Okay. <laughs> But actually, okay. So before I wrap things up, I want to mention that tomorrow on this channel, I will actually be uh, hosting a reading of a script that I've been working on for the past year. And I've hired like a, a couple of different people to uh, come on and uh, read for each of the different characters. So it, it, it'll be oh, cool. fun since uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a, uh, I don't know. It, 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 okay, so it's titled The Antinatalist. And it's about this uh, college professor that uh, brings in like five random strangers and is attempting to convince them all that it is immoral to procreate life uh, or to have children. So that's the uh, the little know, the description for, for the the script. So if anybody's interested in that, it'll be showing up here as a live stream uh, just tomorrow. So at what time? Uh, it'll be in the morning, but I, I'm going to it'll stay up, and, and I'm also probably going to clean up the audio as well. So uh, it'll be let's see, it'll be 10 a.m. EST. Well, I'll try to get okay, up. Okay, right. final thought, that, ready? Um, final yeah. thought. Go for it, Tyler. Have, Have you seen, seen the Karate Kid? Tyler? Yeah, I, I'll respond to the colonial comment later. Yeah, you want to... Um, <laughs> have you seen the Karate Kid? Yes. Mm -hmm. ha Submit, have you seen the Karate Kid? Uh, I have seen uh, a version... Uh, I'm, there are so many versions. I have seen one of the versions. 
Okay. The, the, you probably saw the new the new one. <laughs> About the one where he learned to paint. Yeah. Or sand. I guess so. Wax okay. on, wax off. Wax, wax on, wax, wax off. Yeah. That's right. Up and down, and then the circles. Now these are these are motions and behaviors, psychotechnologies, that were being taught to the individual, and he had no <laughs> reference, no framework, no connection for their usefulness yet. It was just engaging in the behavior. Mm -hmm. I think honestly, this is the the tact, if I may use that word, that that uh, Verveke and some others are taking, yeah. because of the the moralistic frame framing for much of the Western argument, we're we're very wary of people telling us what to do, right and wrong. Mm. And so I think if you can trick them to engage themselves in behaviors that use tools that actually make your brain function better right? That you'll be able to, when the time comes, block the blows, right? Mm. That's the sense of it. So you don't necessarily need to know right from wrong or moralistic behaviors or why you're painting the fence or waxing the car. Um, but if you do so, when the time comes, you will find, aha, when someone's attacking my idea, I can step back into this framework and instead of you know aggressively responding with the defensive mechanism, I am prepared to examine it critically. I I, I think that's that's what's going on. That he doesn't want to frame it in a way that it's uh, not marketable, right? Right. That's right. an and excellent I, point. Just, uh, that uh, I I am glad to hear that. Uh, but again, I had to find out that goes into uh, reading uh, into his mind as to what his strategies. Uh, uh, that, so that's a little caveat there. Yeah, no, well, you know, it's funny. I, I think we we could have a conversation with him at some point and we could ask him directly. Oh, right. some That would be cool, Tyler. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's kind of our plan once we get through the, all these lectures. Uh, wait, wait, there's like, thir they're up to like 39 or 40. So that's like, okay, uh... yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll do it a little bit earlier because like he's not even finished putting them all out, but. Anyway. And, and it, I think it was good that we doubled up. Uh, we, we did two episodes, so it serves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that was good. So, I don't know. We might do that again in the future if he does more part twos or, or if uh, um, for some of the other lectures as well. But yeah, so thank you everyone for watching. We're part of the Beverly community trying to foster good communication and practical collaborative wisdom. The people. Say, say again for Tyler. Collaborative wisdom. Collaborative wisdom. Exactly. That's the phrase we want to get stuck in people's minds. This is a meme we want people to latch on to, so to speak, right? Collaborative sure. wisdom. It's the notion mm -hmm. that we have to remind ourselves constantly that we're not all, or we shouldn't be, rather, egoistic little machines striving to accumulate the most we possibly can before we fall over dead at the end of our lives, that we can actually work together and produce something really, really cool instead. That's right. And something for me, like, clicked during this conversation that didn't click when I was, mm -hmm. when I've been listening to all these lectures and it's because of the interactive approach we have in the conversation, the disruptive approach or the conversation is rather than just passively uh, reading it or listening to it and taking notes, you know, we, we, uh, you know, the conversation, the disruptive approach, it, it, it something clicked and yeah, that's cool. Well, in right. any one of our deficiencies can be lifted up by another's. All right, John, do it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye, guys.